Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, the, before I start, we do need, for safety reasons, to kill, keep the aisle, aisleways clear. So I would appreciate if you would do that. This is the last in the series of uh, symposia or discussions we've had on the Apollo program. And I would say uh, this is probably the mo momentous, one of the momentous uh, events we've had. It is such an honor for me today to have the group of people here on the, uh, on the platform. They've been uh, the people that have made it happen. They've been our, our neighbors, our friends, and they're going to tell you a very interesting story. Uh, and I'm just so pleased to, uh, to have you all here today and have them here today. And I want to express my appreciation to you all for coming. Uh, let, me introduce, let me introduce them. There's uh, Frank Borman. I'm going to forget about this gentleman for a minute. But Frank Borman, <laughs> Apollo 8. Gene Cernan, Apollo 10 and 17. Mike Collins, Apollo 11. Al Bean, Apollo 12. Jim Lovell, Apollo 13. Al Shepard, Apollo 14. Jim Irwin, Apollo 15. And John Young, Apollo 16. The moderator is going to be Jim McDivitt, Apollo 9. Jim uh, used to be my boss when I was in the Apollo Project office. So I'm introducing my boss, who was the head of the uh, Apollo Spacecraft Project Office, and let's give him a welcome. He's going to be the moderator, Jim McDivitt. Thank you, Aaron. Nobody could be Aaron's boss, <laughs> except Ruth, and I know she's his boss. <clears throat> I have a, a very difficult job today trying to moderate. That means that you're supposed to somehow or other imply that you're in control of what's going on, and having worked with these guys before, I know that's an impossible task. <clears throat> I also know this may not be the most dignified symposium that anyone's ever been to before, uh, so I will try to give it a little dignity at, dignity at the beginning, and then we'll turn these guys loose. Uh, I'd like to uh, sort of set the stage for what we're going to talk about today, uh, and that's uh, the Apollo program and how we got to the moon and what we did when we got there. I suppose if you look back in history, you can find that uh, probably the most generally accepted recorded uh, effort of a, of a political uh, organization to use rocketry was probably in the 13th century at a place on the Yellow River called Kai Feng Fu when the Chinese drove off the Mongols by shooting uh, flaming uh, petroleum products at them based, uh, that were on a small rocket. But I think the real place to start on our uh, journey today is probably on uh, July 29, 1955, when President Eisenhower announced that there was going to be a project called Vanguard, whose objective was to stick a satellite in orbit around the Earth. To be an American project, hopefully it would come to fruition in the year 1957, which was the International Geophysical Year. Uh, and everything looked fine, and we started this project. It was assigned to the Navy, and it was going along fairly complex uh, rocket system. Unfortunately, we forgot that there were other people in the world, and that that year happened to be the 100th anniversary of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who was the father of rocketry in the Soviet Union. His birthday happened to be on September 17th. The Soviets, along the way, indicated in a number of articles that were written that they, too, thought they could put a satellite in orbit around the United States, and by the spring, of 1957 were making a lot of noises like they were going to do it very quickly. Uh, we continued on with the Vanguard program, uh, not uh, apparently hurrying very much. And unfortunately, uh, shortly after Tsiolkovsky's birthday on uh, September 17th, October 4th, 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. They launched another one the next month in November. 
We had a major failure on Vanguard in November and another one in December, and the leadership in the country finally decided that we ought to do something more dramatic, turn the Army loose, and beginning early in December, they put together uh, the Jupiter Sea rocket, which they launched on January 31st, two months after they started. There's a moral in that story in that we were farsighted enough to know that we could technically do something, but we weren't astute enough to know that politically and from a public relations standpoint, international relations standpoint, we ought to put some effort behind it and do it. On contrast with that, President Kennedy on May 25th, 1961, announced that we're going to go to the moon in that decade. That only lasts about eight and a half years, and his entire basis for that was Al Shepard's flight, which had occurred about 20 days earlier, and Yuri Gagarin's flight that had occurred about a month earlier than that. So he stuck, he got out there, made a commitment with very little background information, data to go on, but he put the effort behind it. The idea that you need the effort along with uh, being farsighted is very important, and we shouldn't all forget that. We got to, uh, we got through Gemini in uh, the latter part of 1966, and we're about ready to fly Apollo in January 1967 when we had the fire at the Cape and uh, lost three of our, our friends. Uh, that delayed the program for about 18 months, which really put a tight squeeze on getting to the moon by the end of the decade. When we finished Gemini then, uh, we had a lot of knowledge, but we still didn't have that hardware. We finally started flying in October of 1968 uh, with Apollo 7. We then flew in December, March, May, and July, and we're on the moon. We got there because there were a certain number of uh, a certain amount of pre-planning that had to go into that uh, achievement, the, the, the ultimate goal, the landing on the moon. We did all that planning ahead of time, and we categor categorized those missions with letters, C, D, E, F, G. G was the lunar landing. Uh, today we're going to talk about some of the, the missions that led up to there, and then we'll talk about how we explored the moon. I'll mention uh, Apollo 7 since the crew isn't here. That was the C mission. The ob objective of that was to land uh, it was to take off and fly around the Earth long enough to get some experience in the command and service module. They accomplished that very well, and we were able to go on then to Apollo 8. Apollo 8, by the, by the way, was a sort of a fill-in because we were having spacecraft problems and a lot of other things, and it didn't have a letter associated with it. Apollo 9 was the DE mission, Apollo 10 was the F mission, and, and Apollo 11 the G mission. I'd like to have Frank come up now and talk to us about what he did on Apollo 8. Thank you. Thank you. It's great for all of us old timers to be back here today and to remember really a unique period in American history. We were all very fortunate. We had a mandate, we had the, the willing support of the Congress and of the people, and we had an enormously successful and dedicated organization. I think it's appropriate that we might just remember, uh, because in all of the hoopla, and it's, it's been this way from time immemorial, and I'm sure it will be this way for the the rest of man's space by the attention focuses on the astronauts. In reality, though, there were people like Jim Webb who really built NASA in the organization that it was. He, uh, if there's ever an American that deserves a Medal of Freedom, and I hope that somebody's listening, Jim Webb should be, uh, should be awarded it. If you go on down the line, uh, the, the old people from NACA that stood in there that had the knowledge that worked night and day to make this thing work, all of us here uh, or a great deal of gratitude to the people that were left behind. And uh, I mention that because that's particularly true of Apollo 8. Uh, we were, incidentally, Jim Lovell uh, was my companion on Apollo 8, and then I'd also like to introduce Bill Anders, who's now. Bill, would you stand up? Because he was with us, too. Stand up so everybody can see you. Thank you. I, uh, I apologize that he's dressed so casually. If he was still a member of the crew, he'd have a coat and tie on. But he, I don't have any control over him anymore. We were, as Jim pointed out, uh, in Apollo 8, originally to constrained or designed to fly an Earth orbital mission with a lunar module. Uh, that was changed abruptly in August of 68 when the three of us were at the, at the uh, Downey, at the Apollo uh, factory, North American factory, and I got a call, I believe it was on a Sunday, from Deke Slayton, 
They said, come back here right away. We want to talk to you about a different mission. Uh, at that point, I learned that the uh, lunar, we knew the lunar lander had slipped for our mission uh, dramatically. And uh, we were told that they were considering, I think they called it the E-prime, wasn't it? The E-prime mission, which would be a, a long way out. And then somebody had said, well, let's, if we're going out 2,000 miles, why don't we go to the moon? And uh, Slayton asked me if I would be interested in, uh, in taking on that particular mission of going to the moon. I didn't have a chance to, uh, to consult with Jim Lovell and Bill Anders, but uh, they were as anxious as I was, and so we said yes. And from that moment on, our training and, and our total interest was uh, on going to the moon. But behind the scenes were a lot of people uh, that were making decisions. Tom Paine made some courageous decisions, uh, uh, because after all, uh, whether we went or not would depend upon Apollo, uh, Apollo 7. Uh, nobody had uh, ridden the Saturn V before, so there were a lot of ifs, ands, and buts about that. We really didn't know what we were going to do because this had not been one of the planned mission. And we sat. This is, the, this is the example of NASA at that day and that day and age. Chris Kraft, one of the giants of the entire manned space program, called me over to his office. And we had Bill Tyndall, as I recall, and somebody else. And we sat there from about 1 to 5 o'clock and worked out the, uh, the basic flight plan for Apollo 8. I don't know how long it would take NASA to do it today, but I suspect it would be more like five months than five hours. <laughs> In any event, we got the basic uh, decisions made at that point. And uh, one of the other exciting or funny things that uh, McDivitt didn't think was so funny, in the switch, we had to take his spacecraft. And you would have thought that that spacecraft was uh, his lifeblood because he bitched like mad that he was going to lose, lose his spacecraft. And there was no way that you could convince him that our spacecraft had been just as well prepared and just as well built as his was. But anyway, we ended up with a mission to go to the moon, circle it 10 times, and come home. Uh, the, I was fortunate not only to have the dedication of the ground people, but they have just two wonderful guys to work with. Uh, there was a lot of stress, and training in four, four months was not an easy task to turn around. Uh, but I would be less than remiss if I told you that we really had a lot of trouble. 400,000 Americans did their job well. It turned out you know, exactly uh, as we had scheduled in one morning, one very cold morning. Uh, and I never would. Not only was this a cold morning, but the dear people at Kennedy, in addition to uh, to the coldness of the uh, atmosphere had somehow, I think, designed to put liquid oxygen in our uh, suits because it was just very, very cold. We added to it with it. <laughs> but we took off. We flew for three days. Uh, remember now, this was the first time that man had been on the Saturn V, and I'll be honest with you, I did not really believe that we would be able to go to the moon. We would be able to commit to the moon on this particular mission. How many times do things go right the first time in modern America? Not many times. My particular concern at this point was that were it to go wrong, I, I, uh, in other words, if we had a problem that would not allow us to commit to go to the moon, we would spend two weeks in Earth orbit. That was our alternate mission. Now, I'd already done that in Gemini 7 with Jim Lovell. And, you know, that was, that was smaller than the Apollo, but I did not want to spend two weeks in Earth orbit with two sailors. I can tell you that. Not <laughs> once, once, once was enough. Uh, in any event, in any event, over Hawaii, at the exact moment we were supposed to launch, we went. Everything went well. I, I managed to get sick. I guess it was the first uh, case of... Uh, spatial sickness or whatever you call it. I threw up for a little while, but uh, we didn't, decided the doctors didn't need to know about it and went on from there. We, uh, I got well. And the, uh, we, we went on then to, to approach the moon. And again, I wish I could tell you the enormous pride that I had when we were on the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon, at the exact millisecond that we were supposed to see lunar sunrise, which would indicate that we were in the proper orbit, we saw it. Now, that was, a, again, a tribute to the people that, uh, that made it work. And boy, there were a lot of them, and a lot of the 
the leadership was dynamic and it was really great. I, I want to tell you, because you look like most of you are taxpayers, you got your money's worth from Apollo 8 for the first five or six orbits. After that, we, uh, we were dead tired and we were focused more on the Earth that you see in the backdrop here. The Earth became a great attraction. As a matter of fact, uh, I suspect uh, the, uh, we didn't bring back any rocks. About the only thing that we brought back that you can remember was the, uh, the picture of the Earth. There's a great dispute in the crew about who took that picture. <laughs> I'll tell you the true story. <laughs> I saw that, I saw that uh, Earth, and I woke, An Anders was sleeping. If you can imagine that, uh, going to the moon and sleeping. I woke him up and said, I said, Bill, take that picture. That's the one everyone will remember. And he said, I can't. I said, why not? And he said, I don't have enough film. All my film is allocated for scientific purposes, and that's a PR shot. <laughs> that's my story, and I'm going to stick to it. I want you to know that. Actually, I would suggest to you that there's a slight possibility that Anders may have taken that picture. We flew for 10 times. Uh, perhaps one of the only other memorable thing about Apollo 8 was reading from the Bible uh, because it was Christmas Eve. We had been instructed sometime before the launch that we would be indeed circling the moon with a television exposure at that time, and we were told to do something uh, appropriate. Those were the exact words. I've always thought this was a great tribute to this country to uh, allow this forum to influence and propagandize the Earth and then tell the crew to do something appropriate. We searched around and discussed, and finally, uh, at the suggestion of a friend, read from the first ten verses of Genesis, and it seemed to be perfectly appropriate because the, the moon, from our vantage point of 60 miles, was a desolate, God-forsaken place uh, that these other gentlemen will tell you about because they have the opportunity to, uh, to visit it. All in all, on, a, on Apollo 8, uh, for me, was a remarkable experience. The dedication and the friendship of Bill and Jim has meant a great, to me over, great deal to me over the years. Uh, perhaps the, the overriding consideration was of a society and a country that was working hell-bent to lever to, to achieve a mission that, if we think back now, was really unachievable. But we did it. We owe a great deal to the people of NASA and to the rest of you who paid your taxes to support it. Thank you very much. Frank's in trouble. Lovell's going to talk after. <laughs> and I think Bill wants some time, too. I'd like to uh, talk about Apollo 9 for just a few minutes now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had Apollo 7, which was a C mission to make sure that everything worked on a command and service module. We moved the, this E prime mission up in front of D. D sort of had the responsibility for B and E. It was going to be followed by F and G, we'd hoped. Uh, we had a flight patch, which took a long time to design. Very, those, that's probably the most difficult part of the whole flight, is designing your flight patch. Then uh, we had the, the three best-looking guys that ever flew. <laughs> next, next slide. Next slide. Well, I'm going to prove it here in a minute. There they are. There, isn't that a good-looking bunch? We were, we were heavy on f photography in our flight. Uh, next, next slide, please. We had a nice rocket. Everybody had a nice rocket. Next slide. This, this, is, a, this is a really a, we had an EVA. We had red helmets on, on this one. Ne the next one, please. Shows Dave with a red helmet. I was talking to Ru Rusty uh, yesterday, trying to figure out why they had red helmets. We didn't know. Does anybody here know why we had red helmets? <laughs> <laughs> then these are the these are the really good ones. Next slide, please. See, we didn't want to go to the moon and have that sort of nothing background there. We wanted to have the Earth behind our lunar module. And that's the only one that you'll see with the Earth behind it. Then we had the command module the same way. Next one, please. See, isn't that beautiful? A lot, lot better with those clouds in the background. The Hollywood <laughs> part. 
And then the next slide. There are two things that are re of really great consequence that happened on Apollo uh, 9, I think. One is that we got the name the spacecraft. If you go back into the days of Mercury, all of the Mercury spacecraft were named Friendship 7, Phase 7, something 7. And uh, then uh, on, a, on Gemini, the first uh, flight, Gemini 3, uh, Gus and John wanted to name their spacecraft the Unsinkable Molly Brown. So uh, uh, Dr. Uh, George Miller was adamant against the naming spacecraft. After Mercury, they were going to be called Gemini 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But John and, and Gus had this deal worked out, and, and they told George, that the, George Miller that they wouldn't possibly call their spacecraft anything except Gemini 3, and they didn't until about three or four seconds after liftoff. during which time, until it landed, it was known as Molly Brown. <laughs> so I was coming up next, and Ed and I had this really grandiose name called the American Eagle for Gemini 4. And uh, he wouldn't allow that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I guess his threats were more effective with respect to Ed and me, so we didn't name our spacecraft. But by the time we got to, to Apollo 9, we had two spacecraft. And uh, Miller visited us down at the Cape one time, and we were using the names that we had picked Gumdrop and Spider, and he insisted that we not use those names. So I said, okay, uh, said, stand by a minute. So I get off, I got out of the spacecraft, made a phone call to Houston, and uh, talked to uh, Dave, and then we conducted the rest of the mission where we were Apollo 9. And every time Houston made a phone a call to us, we'd both answer, and uh, we had the thing so screwed up in about 10 minutes that even George Miller relented. So we got to call our spacecraft with a name again. Now, I want to I tell you that the guys on Apollo 9 weren't big thinkers because we call our spacecraft Gumdrop and Spider they, because they look like a gumdrop and they look like a spider. It was later on when we had things like Odyssey and Antares and Orion and Endeavor. and uh, you know, These guys had a lot better imagination than I did. But I, I don't want to leave you without talking about that last picture because we also set a first in recovery. On Gemini 4, after we splashed down into the water, uh, in those days we had a thing like looked like a horse collar, the big yellow thing. You sort of stuck your arms in it and when the helicopter lowered it to you, and then he pulled you up into the helicopter. And uh, when they got Ed, they, he got into the thing, and they threw him out into the water and dunked him a few times <laughs> over the helicopter or over the spacecraft into the water, and then they pulled him up. And uh, then he came and got me, and we did the same thing, except they swung me out a long way to get a good head start. <laughs> Bounced me off the heat shield, over I went into the water, and then they trolled for sharks for a few minutes. <laughs> and anyway, I, I was rescued. Uh, that, mean, that means I got home in one piece. Well, on a, up, up until Apollo 9, they'd never tell a lies the recovery. And uh, the, the helicopter squadron that was out in the Pacific or Atlantic, wherever I came down, but it had been <laughs> one of those oceans, you know, they're all the same. Uh, they'd been training for a long time on how to, how to make a pickup. Well, it turned out that um, they really knew how. But on recovery day, their squadron commander thought he ought to be the star, so he went out to do it. He hadn't practiced. And in those days, uh, the way you kept the spacecraft from floating around in the water when the helicopter was blowing air on it was to put a sea anchor out. We had a small sea anchor. We had a lot bigger sea anchor after Apollo 9. Uh, anyway, the helicopter came out, and every time he'd get close to the spacecraft, the downwash off the helicopter would blow the spacecraft away. So he chased us around for about 15 minutes before he even got close. <laughs> and by then, they had changed the uh, pickup from the horse collar to a thing called a Billy Pew net, which was which had an aluminum frame, had aluminum about this big around, rod about that long, and it came up in a big hoop, and there's some other pieces in the back. So all you had to do was throw yourself into this net, and they'd pull you up. Well, they finally got close enough where we could get rusty into it. They did the same thing that we did on Gemini 4, and I thought that was just the standard Navy r rescue procedure. <laughs> you always, you never recover a dirty astronaut. Yeah. So anyway, they, they got, they got Rusty up, and about 15 minutes later, they finally got Dave up, but they tried something really new and innovative, I thought, that they reeled him up 
very quick. And they forgot that you're supposed to get the Billy Pew net out from underneath the helicopter. So when he got to the bottom of the helicopter, they nearly knocked him out by hitting his head on the bottom of the helicopter. And then they came back to get me. You see in that picture there, there's only one life raft. But in reality, there were three life rafts there. And there'd been a scuba guy who had been taking some pictures. And he had ran out, run out of film. And he'd opened up his camera, and he was taking the film out. And so he wasn't watching what was going on. And the, and the Billy Pew nut came and hit him in the back of the neck and knocked him out. He fell over backwards into the water, and he was he was stuck with his feet in the in the life raft and his head underwater, and he was drowning. <laughs> but everybody was interested in me not getting wet or something, so I, finally I had to go back and rescue the guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. Well, anyway, that night they relieved the squadron commander, and we we improved the way that uh, we did recovery. Um, I think that takes care of the highlights of Apollo 9. Except we did have a really nice lunar rendezvous, and we proved that the lunar module would work, and we were then ready for the, for the big rehearsal, the, the thing that was really going to prove out whether or not we could get to the moon and land properly. Uh, that mission was called the F mission, Apollo 10, Gene Cernan. I'd like to say two things, Frank. I'm uh, glad to hear your side of, the, of Apollo 8. Uh, I've heard uh, Lovell and Anders uh, discuss Apollo 8 for a long time, and now I really know what happened. <laughs> the other thing, uh, the other thing, Jim, you've got to understand that the uh, uh, you and Frank are both Air Force officers, uh, and the Navy need a lot of training. And I'm not sure that it wasn't planned that way, because for the rest of us, I think it worked out pretty well. I'd just like to, uh, to take a few minutes here that I have and, uh, and first of all, additionally welcome all of you. I, I know we have a lot of guests, but I also know we have a lot of, uh, of folks here at JSC. It, it's good to be around, uh, around friends that, uh, that made it happen. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. You, as, as Frank in, indicated, we're simply the tip of the arrow, and uh, we get the, the visibility and perhaps more credit than is deserved. But uh, we got to the moon and we got back safely. We were able to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish uh, because of uh, folks that were here at JSC and throughout this country and industry and, uh, and the universities that were supporting our efforts. And I'd like to thank those of you who are still here. And for those, you, those of you who are what I might classify young Turks, uh, 25, 30 years old, uh, probably were 5, 8, 10, 12 years old when these missions that we're talking about occurred. Utilize this week to look back in history and utilize it to, to challenge yourself as to what you and this country can do when we really want to do something that's important. Uh, the door's been open. Uh, I think we truly have, uh, have opened a vision and an opportunity to the future, but it's going to take an awful lot of an effort, an awful lot of dedication. Uh, uh, I heard Dr. Guru say if we had to go to the moon today, he's not sure it wouldn't take twice as long. I don't think it should. I think we've got the same kind of talent, the same kind of people, and the same kind of dedication. Uh, learn from those who went before you because they did an unquestionably superb job to get the job done. And I can only say on behalf of all of us here and all of us who are not here who had this opportunity, uh, uh, I really sincerely thank you. Uh, let me show just a couple slides because you're going to see me again at the end of the line. But I've got a couple slides on, uh, on Apollo 10. And this was a crew of Apollo 10, Tom Stafford in the middle, John Young, that handsome young-looking guy at the right-hand side of the screen, is at the right-hand side of this podium over there. And if you think 20 years hasn't taken its toll, just <laughs> and I and I and I don't know where uh, where Jim McDivitt got his gray hair, but when you fly with Tom Stafford twice, you deserve gray hair. I want to promise you. And flying with John is, uh, those of you who know John or who know of him or have worked with him, is probably the greatest thrill a human being can have in space flight, uh, particularly going to the moon together. We did have a good time. Uh, we also designed uh, a patch, Apollo 10 patch. It was a little mechanical, if I can have the next slide. Uh, and in those early days, both the names of the spacecraft and our patches were, were sort of indicative of the mechanics of what we were doing. I think we got more philosophic philosophical later later in the missions when, when we realized, when we really had a chance to reflect on the kind of pictures 
that Frank and his crew brought, brought back and began to think about where we were going and what we might see. But Apollo 10 tried to capture, I think it was done by an engineer, it tried to capture everything at once. We were going to leave the Earth, we were going to rendezvous, or we we're going to go to the moon, rendezvous around the moon. Uh, we we're going to find a lunar limb coming from somewhere which didn't quite get uh, uh, close enough to the surface to land. But anyway, that was our Apollo 10 patch. Let me go very quickly into uh, a little bit of the, uh, of the background of how we, we eventually got to the moon on Apollo 10. We were originally the backup crew for Apollo 1, Tom Stafford, John Young, and myself, uh, and were conducting a similar test uh, out at Downey in an altitude chamber that the uh, crew of Apollo 1 was conducting at the pad uh, in, at Kennedy when the, uh, when the fire occurred. And obviously it was quite a shock, but uh, as you all know, and uh, with the help of a great many people, we were able uh, as a nation to recover from that shock. Even though we were assigned to that backup crew, things got things changed drastically after that, and they continued to change. The DEF, I don't even remember all those numbers and all those missions to the moon anymore. But just because you were on a backup crew, or just because you were assigned to one particular mission, there was never a guarantee, never a guarantee that you were going to rotate or get assigned to another mission. Uh, so after Apollo, uh, uh, our backup on Apollo 1, we did continue to back up the first Apollo mission. We backed up uh, Wally Shira and his crew on Apollo 7. And fortunately, we then rotated uh, to Apollo 10. And we weren't sure what the mission of Apollo 10 was really going to be. It changed a number of times. We intended to have a lunar module. Uh, as Frank indicated to you, uh, when they went to the moon without a lunar module, it sort of shifted things around a great deal. Uh, they took a tremendous risk, as we saw from uh, the results of Apollo 13, uh, when Jim utilized, Jim Lovell and his crew utilized the lunar module to get home. But going out to the moon at that time, we probably didn't appreciate it, without that module was a significant risk. Uh, Apollo 10 uh, was destined to go to the moon with the lunar module. There were some people that said, well, if you go that far and you take the risk of, of uh, flying in that Saturn V and going to lunar distance and getting in a lunar module uh, and going down near the surface, uh, should we not take the risk and go all the way? Uh, we weren't really wet, ready to do that. Uh, the program, I don't believe, was really ready to do that. We had a lot of software uh, questions and problems with the software. Uh, we had a lunar module that was coming along and continually being made better. Uh, uh, it had to become lighter to give it the capability, the, the margins of capability to get off the surface. Reminds me of, after having spent some time with the Soviets on their program during Apollo Soyuz, uh, we were confronted with uh, something obviously they've been confronted with in the past as well. They have a model on top of one of, uh, one of their uh, entrance to one of their buildings that says the evil of good is better. The evil of good is better. And we were confronted with that in the Apollo 10, Apollo 11 days 20 years ago. Uh, how good do you want to make the lunar module? How safe do you want to make it before you can actually go on this mission? And there was a point at which you had to say, stop, it's good enough. Let's take it and let's go with it. Well, we took a lunar module that, uh, that really, for all practical purposes, worked superbly on Apollo 10. Uh, we, did we, we did leave Earth orbit as planned. Uh, we did get to the moon. We were to conduct a number of, uh, or the, prove out the rendezvous, prove out the capability, the thermal capability of the, the lunar module, the software as far as we could take it, and, uh, and also the landing radar. We separated from John in, uh, in the command module. By the way, we were, we call our spacecraft uh, Snoopy and Charlie Brown. Uh, Snoopy because that's what the lunar module was to do, was to snoop around the surface in preparation to, to, uh, to Apollo 11. And, uh, and I don't know why we called the command module Charlie Brown, except John reminded us of a lot of things, and maybe it was Charlie Brown as well. <laughs> but I'll tell you what that did. I think the, one of the most important things uh, about the program was to allow other people to identify with what we were doing. There were so many people at that time who stood in awe. Uh, of the space program and in awe of astronauts and believe me we all put our pants on one leg at a time just like everybody else and to, to allow people particularly the people that were bowling on the heat shield and were developing the software and that were working with you that were that were giving you the privilege and opportunity to go on the moon to establish some identity with them was very important as a result of naming our spacecraft Snoopy and Charlie Brown we utilized that symbol the symbol of Snoopy is a symbol of excellence it was a symbol of pride that people throughout NASA, and particularly through, through, uh, 
through the major centers could 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 hold their heads high about it was something that we strive for it it meant we can do it and it just happened that way but it was it was a way we could allow them to have some identity what with what was going on but we went to the moon we separated we did go down to the to within about forty seven or fifty thousand feet of the lunar surface and we're traveling a few thousand miles an hour believe me it's tough to to, to really tell how high you are. But as I said in, in, on tape at that time, and a lot of times you say things you don't know you say. Uh, <laughs> few of you were around in Apollo 10, weren't you? Uh, and I said, you know, I said, boy, we are really down among them, and we were. I, I felt like if we stuck our, our, our feet out the lunar module, we would just drag over those, those mountaintops as uh, we skirted the, 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 the surfaces uh, of, of, the, of the moon. And it was, it was truly... An overpowering experience. We had, we were relatively problem-free. I think John may probably relate a few other things about Apollo 10, uh, with one exception. I remember quite, quite vividly uh, on one of those passes when we were about to stage the lunar descent section from the ascent sections in preparation to the way it would be done on the surface of the moon. Uh, all of a sudden, one of our thrusters fired, and the lunar module sort of spun out of control for six or eight seconds. And I do vividly remember the lunar horizon going around three times out my window. Uh, the, 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 uh, the words that were said at that time uh, put, X, put Apollo 10 on the X-rated film list. Uh, it was something like, golly gee whiz, what the hell happened? Uh, and quite frankly, I didn't know what I had said until I'd gotten back and somebody told me. It was just a, a normal reaction. I got a lot of mail after that. and. Uh, People would say, we're, you know, you're proud Amer we're proud Americans, you did a great thing, and boy, we're glad to, to know that you're a human being, and the next letter had come, and we're proud Americans, uh, you did a great thing, but how could you use such language in front of my children? <laughs> so, you, 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 just, you just can't win. But we, uh, the biggest secret, and even some of my colleagues probably don't know this, and Jim McDivitt, who eventually was Apollo program manager, uh, probably the greatest secret that is still concealed in the hearts and minds of Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan is who threw the switch that made the thruster fire <laughs> at that moment in time and space? And uh, we may never know, may we? <laughs> I know, and as long as Tom's not here, maybe I'll tell everybody. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we then had a, what was obviously a successful mission. People say, well, you're disappointed you didn't land. And my God, how could you be disappointed? just given the, given the opportunity to go out to lunar distance. You know, this is probably, this may be the greatest thing we brought back in all of Apollo, the feeling, the, the, the feeling of what we saw and what we felt. The, the moon is majestically beautiful, there's no question about it, but looking at the Earth from, from lunar distance is, is so overpowering, it's something I don't think anybody uh, can ever put out of their mind and, and can forget. And this is a two-dimensional multicolored picture on a black background, but when you're out there and you see a, a moon four, or an Earth four times the size of the Earth, uh, you see the three dimensions of it. You see it surrounded by a, block, a blackness that's got depth. That's something you, you retain here for a long time. And, and, and the Earth is not only overpoweringly beautiful, it's your, it's your identity. Uh, it's, it's home. It's your identity with reality uh, from a vantage point a corner a million miles away where Reality at that moment in time uh, it seems almost like a dream. Uh, it, it's something uh, that that I brought home and, and had a chance to re-examine on Apollo 17. That uh, to me, perhaps even even more memorable than uh, than stepping foot on the surface of the moon is to be able to look back and and just think about what this is all about and what we truly are all about. But Apollo 10 was simply a link in a chain. Uh, the chain changed directions a number of times, but we obviously uh, were able to put those links together in a proper sequence, in a proper order, to, uh, to get where we wanted to go. It was, uh, it was a wonderful mission. It was, a, it was a, an exciting time. Uh, I came back uh, selfish, with, with a feeling of selfishness almost because I couldn't share it with everybody else. You want to tell someone else about it. And if there's one problem with happened with that period of time, with the period of, of Apollo, uh, is that it all happened so fast that I'm sure 
and, and I believe most of my colleagues feel the way I did. It, it had to happen and it had to be a part of your life that was put behind you before you could really reflect upon the significance of it all. And I truly believe that it may be another generation, maybe another 50 or 100 years before we ever truly appreciate what we have accomplished in this period of time in history. But the one thing that I do know is the one thing the President said, said uh, uh, yesterday uh, in Washington. He said it's the spirit of Apollo. That's the legacy of this country. It's the spirit of Apollo that will live on. And it's the spirit of Apollo that will take us back to the moon and take us on to Mars. And ladies and gentlemen, whether you work here at JSC, uh, whether you had any part in Apollo or whether you will have any part in shuttle uh, or space station freedom, or whether you simply pay taxes and believe very strongly in God and your country, you are that spirit. And God bless you, and we do appreciate it. Tom and Gene and John landed in May of 1969. That's a uh, little bit less than eight years after President Kennedy said we were going to go to the moon. Uh, during that period of time, we'd finished up the Mercury program, flown the entire Gemini program, and flown out all the prerequisite missions for the lunar landing. And so it was time for Apollo 11. Mike? Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Can have the first uh, slide, please? Hard to believe it's 20 years since uh, those, those great days of Apollo. Uh, that design, that Apollo 11 patch, uh, sort of evolved as m the, if you were to pick one person uh, responsible for it, it'd be Jim Lovell. I think one day he and I were yakking about symbology outside the simulator, what kind of an idea would be nice for 11. And uh, I think it was Jim who came up with the notion of an eagle landing and uh, and of course we thought that that eagle should bring something with it an olive branch or a laurel wreath or what have you and uh, and where did eagles carry those things well they carried them in their beaks so we uh, I, I sketched it out and got a professional artist to fill it in and uh, we sent it into channels and uh, came back disapproved because uh, the eagle had these gigantic talons, uh, these warlike talons that were swooping down in a military fashion about to do bad things to the moon. And uh, uh, so we switched the, uh, the olive branch to the eagle's claws, and, uh, and the second time it, it greased through. Uh, after the flight, someone from MPAD, Mission Planning and Analysis Division, came up and said, you, you know that, that patch is, uh, is all wrong about the Earth. And uh, I didn't know what was wrong with it. And they said, well, the, we had the sunlight coming from the wrong quadrant there. It should be coming from up above. And that uh, shadow zone, instead of being on the left-hand side of the moon, uh, should be on the, the bottom of the moon. So I don't know 100 years from now how many people will notice that <laughs> difference. But uh, the patch is wrong. Uh, and you know, we were, uh, our attitude in those days was, you know, don't bother us with this uh, this trivial stuff. Uh, we we're saving our time for the for the important stuff, and uh, and that was a valid point of view. We didn't want to get killed. We knew uh, we had to m learn a lot of technical stuff, and that was where our priorities lay. And the the, the 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 visual part, the symbology, was not important. But this is what will be remembered a hundred years from now. So I guess in retrospect, I'd have to say that a lot of the things that we thought were were not important. Uh, truly are. Uh, I remember the Gemini patches. I thought they were very nice. They were very amateurish, but they, uh, they kind of came from the heart and they made no pretense of being uh, professional or polished. And I, and I like those. And the Apollo patches I like not as well. I mean, they were, they were more professional and slicker, but uh, I don't think they were particularly well done. And I don't think the shuttle ones are, are particularly well done. They're, you know, they're, uh, they're too, uh, you know, they're too complicated. There's the, uh, as the architects uh, say, less is more. And uh, it seems to me that people try to cram too much information into those things. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that of the two flights I had anything to do with, Gemini 10 and Apollo 11, you will not find crew names anywhere near the patches. Uh, second slide, please. 
Uh, this is my favorite photograph. Uh, I, I call it, uh, if I were putting a caption on it, I'd call it, uh, there they are, because uh, there, there they are. There's a, there's on the one thing there, there's three billion of them, and on the other thing there, there's two of them, and that's all there are. There, there they are. Uh, and uh, I like that. But, uh, but uh, that picture was, was taken by accident. Uh, uh, it was not pre-planned in any way. I just happened to have the camera handy when the earth popped up and I scrambled for it and, and shot a couple of exposures. Uh, we, as I say, we, we were worried about the important stuff and we weren't worried about this trivial stuff. Uh, uh, it seems to me if I had to do over again, maybe I'd think a little more about, uh, about the trivia, a little bit more about how these missions appeared to, uh, to the public. Uh, third slide, third and last. That's a great picture. That's the best picture of, of Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon. And it's, uh, I think, probably the only picture of Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon uh, and taken by Neil Armstrong. That's a, a portrait of, of Neil Armstrong. You, uh, you see him uh, reflected in the, uh, in the gold visor there. And I think that's a, just a beautiful picture. Uh, and I would guess that that is something that neither, I haven't, talk to Neil or Buzz about this, but my guess is that this is not a picture that either one of them planned. It just kind of, just kind of happened. As I say, we were worried about the important things. Uh, that's the end of the slides. You can turn those off. Another uh, unimportant thing were, were the television programs that we sent back from the command module. That camera was sort of an afterthought, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not too much when I say that uh, as we were walking out to the launch pad, someone stuffed it in my hands and said, here, this is the TV camera now. Put on a really slick, polished, well-rehearsed, professional, uh, awe-inspiring show because you're going to have a billion people watching you. And uh, <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, Armstrong and Alden didn't even know how to work that camera. I mean, they had never, uh, you know, I was the only one who knew how to turn it on, and that was about all I knew. And, uh, you know, I think had we given a little more thought to uh, what was going on inside the command module and a little more thought to televised uh, shows and a little more attention perhaps to still photography inside the command module and out, we, we might have uh, done a little bit better job on, a, on Apollo 11. Another complaint I, I have in retrospect is, is the aural, the how do things sound. Uh, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the uninformed person, uh, just the average uh, taxpayer, most of the stuff coming from uh, Apollo was unintelligible. And, and there's some uh, good reasons for that. There was an awful lot of technical information that had to get passed back and forth. But uh, somehow, despite that, I wish we had paid a little more attention to the English language, and I wish we had paid a little more attention to uh, what the average person, if there is such a thing as an average person, who knows very little or nothing about the space program. What, what impression would they get from, from listening to us? And, uh, and, and unfortunately, I think uh, many of them would get a, a, a very muddled kind of a message, and uh, I wish we had done a little better job on that. I think there were some uh, parts of it that were, that were terrific. I thought that, uh, that reading Genesis on Apollo 8 was a, was a wonderful idea, and, and, and that's the kind of thing that we should have uh, given more thought to and, and done a better job at. You know, when the history of the uh, solar system gets written, and uh, for all any of us know, it may already have been uh, written, I, I think the moon will be kind of assumed. I mean, uh, you would just assume that people would go from a planet out to this dinky little satellite that, that orbits that planet. Uh, I, I don't think that would be considered very important. I think the, uh, the important thing would be, uh, were we wanderers? Are we wanderers? And I think... Uh, we are, we Earthlings. We always have been, and I think we'll continue to be. And there's such fascinating places out there in the solar system, uh, far beyond the moon. Uh, the one that comes to mind is, uh, is Titan, one of uh, Saturn's moons. It's, uh, it has many of the uh, chemical ingredients that were in the Earth's atmosphere early in its history, uh, methane and, and, and other carbon and hydrogen uh, 
compounds. It has a thick atmosphere, thicker than the Earth's atmosphere, unbreathable, but nonetheless a thick atmosphere. It has a very cold surface, icy cold surface, frozen surface. It has a hot core, it has oceans. Well, it seems to me somewhere between the hot core and the cold surface, there have to be oceans at almost any temperature you would like. Uh, no photosynthesis could take place down in the depths of those oceans because of the cloud coverage and because of the fact you're so far from the sun. However, recently in the depths of our own oceans, we found uh, near hot volcanic vents deep in the oceans, we found life processes that are independent of sunshine, independent of photosynthesis. And they uh, rely on a hydrogen sulfide uh, chemistry, and you find gigantic tube worms, maybe six feet long, that uh, live down there and feed off microorganisms that in turn eat uh, hydrogen sulfide. So there, why couldn't that why couldn't that process also be taking place out on Titan? I don't know, maybe not, but it just seems to me it'd be fascinating to go on out into the solar system, and uh, we will one of these times, and when we have done it, I think the, the moon will not be as important uh, as it appears to us here today. Uh, just take the sister planet of Earth, Mars, for example. The moon has no atmosphere. Mars does, a thin one, but it has atmosphere. Uh, the moon fundamentally is totally bone dry. The Mars has a great deal of water. It used to have a lot of more, a lot more water. It used to have water coursing through deep channels. Now has frozen water and frozen carbon dioxide on the north and south poles. Uh, the topography, in, in my opinion, of the moon is, is, is fundamentally monotonous. I think you have to be a geologist to love the moon. Um, <laughs> Mars is much more interesting. Uh, mountains three times as high as Mount Everest. Uh, Canyons ten times as long as the Grand Canyon. Wonderful photography. Uh, possibility that life might have been there at one time. Probably not today. Just altogether a, a fascinating spot. And, uh, and I hope we'll, we'll continue to remember that as, uh, as we digest uh, President Bush's speech of, of yesterday. Um, what was Apollo all about to me? Fundamentally, it was about leaving. Uh, in... Uh, and if that's so, I'm not sure that's so, but if it's so, then I think uh, Apollo 8 is, the, uh, is probably the most important of the, uh, of the Apollo missions. Uh, Apollo 11 was uh, more about arriving. Uh, Apollo 8 was more about leaving. Uh, to me, uh, I think we're going to leave. We're going to leave the surface of this planet and, and go out into the uh, rest of the solar system. And uh, if we can ever get by Mr. Einstein's 55-mile-an-hour speed limit, maybe maybe even beyond that. I uh, wanted to save some uh, time for later. I'm going to give some time back. Uh, I've already spoken uh, close to 15,000 words, which is the average a man speaks in a day. So I want to save some for later. <laughs> average, uh, average, average woman speaks 20,000 words in a day. Uh, I, uh, I mentioned this to a friend of mine. He said, yes, he knew. His problem was that when he came home from work, he'd already used up his 15. His wife had not yet started on her 20. <laughs> Mike, watching the audience, I could see you had it right in the palm of your hand until the last 30 seconds. <laughs> and then you had half of them in the palm and half of them not. <laughs> it was amazing, uh, the fact that we got to the moon at Apollo 11. There were so many times along the way when I'd come home from work thinking, there is no way we're going to do this thing. We can't get the lunar module light enough. We can't get the radars working. How are we going to get the engines running right? And by gosh, we got there in exactly the order that we, we had planned, although I must say I think a lot of us didn't expect it to go exactly like that was fantastic. Well, the interesting thing was that President Kennedy gave us this very simple charge, land on a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth in this decade. And now we have. But we still have a lot of other guys sitting up here. <laughs> uh, I'd left the astronaut program by then, and I was over in the Apollo spacecraft program office. And uh, somewhere between Apollo 9 and Apollo 10, I was given the responsibility of trying to figure out how we were going to explore the moon. 
And I remember being down at the Cape with Sam Phillips, who was the Apollo program director, about two or three days before Apollo 11 launched. He was saying, uh, you know, if they're successful, what are we going to do on 12? Uh, where do you think we ought to land? Well, may I, may I have the first slide of that other group of three slides I had? There we go. I hope you can see that, but there's a, there's a blue spot over there on the right somewhere. Can you see that? That's where Apollo 11 landed. It was a big flat spot because we weren't too sure of the procedures that were going to be used in getting us down to precisely the spot that we wanted to go. And after Apollo 11 landed, we, there was, was an error in the, where they landed. Uh, we had to get a, a little bit more accurate, we thought, to be able to explore some of the more tricky places. So may I have the next slide, please? The next two places we wanted to go were on the, on the left-hand side. Now, the, the first place we landed was the Sea of Tranquility, a big flat spot. We picked another big flat, for, a big flat spot for Apollo 12, which was called the Ocean of Storms, but we picked a very precise point. Um, and if we could get to that precise point, then we could start going to the more difficult places. The next one would have been Fral Morrow on Apollo 13, but we couldn't get there on 13, and we went on to 14. Um, to, make the, uh, to make sure we could get to the right spot, we, we picked a crater that had, a, had an old surveyor sitting at the bottom. Those, uh, that next group of three missions was called the H group of, uh, of missions, G, H. And during that period of time, just prior to Apollo 11 and just uh, after Apollo 11, we redesigned the lunar module and the, and the uh, command module, added a lot more equipment to them, uh, uh, designed the lunar rover, the electric uh, car that ran around, put cameras and things on it. So the, the remaining missions were really grouped into two categories, the H missions, 12, 13, and 14, and the, and the J missions, 15, 16, and 17. The first H mission, Alan Bean. Thank you, Jim. Um, when I was asked to come here today and be with this august group, I really didn't know what to do, and so I asked the people at NASA, I said, well, what, what do you think I ought to talk about? What have you got in the way of visual aids? They said, well, maybe the thing to do is take, to use the film that you used on your world trip that you went on for the president, 21 countries, 42 days, and, and I said, well, yeah, I guess I could use that. I said, well, that, that really isn't the one I wanted to take on the world trip. Anyway, I said, and you know, then I had to take it. I worked for NASA, now I'm an artist. One of the nice things about being an artist is nobody can fire you. You can do what you want. So I said, where is that? Where is that film? Where's the film that I remember uh, Robert Gilder said, this film must never be seen. <laughs> uh, later on, Aaron Cohen caught me as I walked in the door. He says, you haven't got that film you wanted to take on the world trip with you. And I said, no, I don't have it on me. You can see it. But uh, let's go ahead and run what I've got up there. And let's see uh, the real story of Apollo 12. Turn these lights down a little. Can you turn the lights in the front down a little? Mind and body for the task ahead. Apollo 12, man's second landing on the moon. For on the moon, the United States astronaut is on his own. There is no one to get him out of trouble. He is his own man, no mere puppet of the scientific community. He is an individual with no strings attached. But it is in these endless simulations that the skills are learned, skills that may one day mean life or death on the moon. And while Pete Conrad trained with great dexterity, Dick uh, Gordon and Al Bean also felt the intensive heat of training, including emergency slide wire egress at the Cape. On November 14, 1969, three heroes struck out for the launch pad. Pete Conrad, Al Bean, Dick uh, Gordon.
hours of rehearsals and simulations had gone into making the countdown the precise operation it had become. Every second was critical. And there was no doubt that barring some unforeseen disaster, the bird would leave the pad on the precise predicted second. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the 49-minute mark in our countdown. We're now T-minus 48 minutes and 53 seconds and counting. The count is going well, but the weather appears to be deteriorating. <laughs> However, we are still counting. 47 minutes, 30 <laughs> seconds and counting. The Apollo 12 spacecraft and that Saturn V launch vehicle at Cat A are still going well at this time. Chief Conrad has uh, completed his guidance and control checks in the spacecraft. With a precision that exemplified the entire mission, the three adventurers of Apollo 12 lifted off. a contingency sample and began the first of a series of scientific descriptions that would astound the earthbound scientists. Something. 
One of the most fascinating discoveries of the mission. Hey, there's another one of those mounds over there. Where? Where do you suppose they are? I don't know. You know where they are? They're this sort of mound. Looks like they don't take this the wrong way. It looks like a small volcano. They assemble the Alpap. While Conrad set up the lunar atmosphere experiment called SIDE. Cannon began stamping down the lunar soil to make a firm foundation for the seismometer. During this second traverse, that they continued to astound the scientists with their simple descriptions and superb terminology. <laughs> about in earnest, earnestness that exemplified the entire mission to collect meaningful samples of the lunar topography. Holy up their expedition and headed back to the land. Time for Dick Gordon in the command module to prepare for docking and stow his equipment. So once more, the intrepid crew arrive back at Earth for re entry with an accuracy and precision that exemplified the entire mission.
the crew of a mission that established a pace and style for future missions to follow. And this was a fitting conclusion, a conclusion that exemplified the entire mission. Now that film was made courtesy of our backup crew, which was uh, Dave Scott, uh, Al Worden, and Jim Irwin. So uh, they're the producers, directors, and the cast members. So. <laughs> when I see it, I always ask myself, what would, the, what would the leaders of foreign countries think when we got there and showed them that film? So <laughs> thank you. Like I said in the beginning, I wasn't going to be in control. <laughs> so the next flight was Apollo 13. It was supposed to land at Frau Morrow, and unfortunately on the way there was a, a large explosion in the service module, and uh, the three guys that flew on Apollo 13 had probably the most exciting ride known to man and were the people who uh, took the ride are still alive and with us, uh, Jim Lovell. Gosh, I feel a little bit like the uh, comedian that has to follow the fan dancer after that particular one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was on Apollo 13. I don't know if we have a uh, slide of the uh, insignia or not. And you know, all the uh, uh, vehicles were named uh, after Snoopy and Gumdrop and things like that. We're sort of named patriotic. We had Columbia and we had Eagle and we had things of this nature. But we decided to go back to the basics and we named our spacecraft uh, Odyssey and Aquarius. Now, you might want to figure out why. Aquarius, of course, was quite popular at that time, but it wasn't because of the play. Aquarius was the, uh, from Egyptian mythology, and she was the lady that brought water from the Nile Valley to, get, to make the Nile fertile, and we were going to bring knowledge from the moon, and that was the reason why we named the lunar module Aquarius. Well, we had that name pretty much in the beginning, but we were trying to figure out what to name the command module, and we thought of all sorts of things, and we really couldn't get to anything. And finally, we came up with the name Odyssey. Now, it wasn't until after this mission that we found out, I read in the Webster's Dictionary, that Odyssey was a long voyage with many changes of fortune. <laughs> be, be careful how you name your spacecraft after this. <laughs> well, you notice that by this time through Apollo 12, things were getting to be quite complacent, a little hilarious. We had a lot of fun. We were doing a lot of things. And suddenly, we were charging along, and sort of the interest in space sort of wavered a little bit. We had landed twice on the flat areas of Mari, and geologists thought that perhaps we ought to land in the hills of the highlands, and they said, let's go to Frau Maro. And that was our main dream, was to go to Frau Maro. We took off on April 11th, uh, 1970, at 1313 Central Standard Time. <laughs> now, I'm not a superstitious fellow. Apollo 13, 1313, but we took off. On the way up on the booster, we happened to lose the center engine on the second stage about two minutes early. It just shut down due to high vibrations. And for that moment, we thought that this was the crisis of this particular flight, because most space flights, with the exception perhaps of eight, usually had something go wrong with them. But we had enough fuel, we had enough uh, power and enough uh, engine power to get us into Earth orbit and then push us on to the moon. Now, this was my fourth flight into space, and it was you know, I was getting to be uh, quite complacent. Uh, it was very familiar, the stars, the sights, the sounds, the smells. Borman wasn't on board this one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you might know that the way we go to the moon is go on a free return course. And this means that if our maneuvering engine of our spacecraft doesn't work, uh, even the little attitude thrusters can get us around the moon and back home again, hopefully to make a safe landing. But the land of this place called Frau Maro at the proper time and the proper sunlighting conditions so that we could see the rocks and sort of miss them because we felt that they'd be kind of rocky in these hills, we had to get off the free return course. 
we got on a course that took us to the moon and around the moon, but sh should something happen to the spacecraft, it would bring us back to the Earth, but the closest point of approach would be about 2,500 nautical miles, much too far out to be captured by the Earth's atmosphere. But we didn't worry. It had been done before. Everything was fine. On to the moon. It was about 56 hours after we took off. Two spacecraft were mated together. Fred Hayes and I wandered on into the lunar module. I had a television camera in my hand. I learned to use it by this time. <laughs> and uh, Fred, was, Fred was floating around. It was two days out. And we had a television program that was coming back to Control Center here in Houston. Now, this was the third lunar landing mission. It was a Monday night. There was a baseball game in Houston. And the program got no farther than the Control Center here in Houston. I had just said, you know, good night, Chet, or something like that. I was coming back down through the tunnel into the command module again, and I heard a hissed bang. The spacecraft rocked back and forth. The jet started a fire to stabilize the spacecraft. I looked up at Fred, and Fred looked down at me, and I knew that Fred didn't know what caused this bang. And then I looked over at our third companion, Jack Schweikert. He was over there in the left seat, and his eyes were as wide as saucers. Not only did he not know what caused the bang, but he was saying to himself, why am I here? <laughs> you see, just three or four days before we were to take off, we replaced the prime crew member, Ken Mattingly, with his backup, Jack Schweikert, because the doctors were positive that Ken Manley would come down with the measles. Well, Jack was a very competent guy, but I could see the expression on his face. <laughs> About this time, in the command module, I looked up at the warning panel, and a light came on. It said, something's wrong with your electrical bus. Two more lights came on. It said, two out of three of your fuel cells have just died. At about that time, a wave of disappointment went through the spacecraft. <laughs> You see, one fuel cell was more than sufficient to go around the moon and come home. We could get enough electrical power out of it, but without all three operating, our mission rules said, you can't land on the moon. Here it was my second time up here, all that training. And then I wandered over into the center of the spacecraft, and I was looking at the instruments that told me the condition of two huge liquid oxygen tanks that we had way back in the service module. On the quantity gauge of one, it read zero. And on the quantity gauge of the other, I could see the needle slowly go down. That's when the old lead weight started to go down to the bottom of my stomach, and I realized that perhaps there was something serious here. <laughs> and then I wandered over to where Jack was sitting, and I went past Jack, looked out the side window, and I could see escaping at a high rate of speed a gaseous substance from the rear end of my spacecraft. And it didn't take much intelligence on my part to realize that the gas escaping from the rear end and the needle on my second and last oxygen tank were one and the same. And very shortly, we'd be completely out of oxygen. And when that occurred, because we used oxygen to produce electricity in our fuel cells, the third fuel cell would die and we'd be completely out of electrical power. And when that occurred, because we gimbaled our maneuvering engine by means of electricity, we would lose our propulsion system we were sort of in deep trouble. We did have on board inside this spacecraft a little battery that would last about five hours just for the re-entry into the atmosphere and a little oxygen tank for the very same purpose after we threw away all the large consumables. The time the explosion occurred, we were some 200,000 miles from Earth, about 90 hours from Earth because we had to go around the moon to get back home again. And of course, we were going in the wrong direction in the first place. The Earth was back there. Well, the ground at first didn't quite realize that all this was going on. They kept knocking their instruments. They said, you know, something wrong with telemetry here. All this can't be happening. Uh, but Fred and I sort of realized they were in deep trouble. And about the time that Fred and I met each other at the tunnel to squiggle on our way through to the lunar module, the ground called up and said, say, uh, perhaps you ought to get in that lunar module and use it as a lifeboat to see what we can do. Well, the first thing we did was to turn on all the systems and uh, try to get everything going. Uh, we had a, a radio system on, which we had what was called Hot Mic and Press to Talk. We thought we were on the Press to Talk version so that we could talk back and forth and it would not go outside the confines of the spacecraft. 
unfortunately, we were on hot mic. And for about an hour and a half, we kept saying things back and forth that we didn't know anybody else was listening to. And the one thing I can recall saying, which I heard about from Dr. Payne when we got back, was the fact that, that I said, take a good look at the moon, fellas. No one's going to be up here for another long time. He had took about two or three days to talk to the media and said, no, what he really means was this. <laughs> <laughs> the ground said, get back on that free return course. We'll give you all the parameters. They did everything. We turned on all the devices, the guidance system, the computer, everything in the lunar module. I had to learn to fly all over again because with this big dead command module attached to me, if I pressed down on the attitude controller, the thing would go off in some wild gyration. So I had to learn where to go with the attitude controller to control the vehicle. But we did light the engine, the descent engine this time, the engine that we were going to use to land on the moon. It pushed this combination over to what we thought was the free return course. And of course, by this time, the moon is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we can see it, and we're coming, and Fred Hayes in the back of an old envelope was going back and forth and saying, you know, Jim, we don't have enough electrical power to get home. He says, I don't think we have enough water to make it home, and, and I really don't know about the oxygen. <laughs> you see, the lunar module was designed to only last for 45 hours. And I said, well, that's, that's very nice, Fred. Uh, <laughs> The ground caught up and with, uh, you know, all the contractors and the NASA people working with slide rules and all that sort of stuff came up with the very same conclusion, <laughs> that uh, you probably won't make it back home at the rate you're going. And uh, we said, uh, well, what can we do? They said, we have an idea. As you round the moon, we're going to have you light that descent engine a second time. Probably keep it on for a long period of time. And perhaps it can push you faster and faster back home and you'll get back into the atmosphere before you run out of electrical power and water. We did have, by the way, enough oxygen. I said, fine. And they said, okay, now we're going to send the backup crews down to the simulators and see if this system really works. But you be ready to copy when uh, we get the procedures, because as soon as you go around the back side of the moon, you will lose communication. I said, fine. A little while later, they came up and said, are you ready to copy? The procedure, I think, will work. And I said, fine. My two companions were next to me. They started reading the procedures, and I started copying down everything, and I, I, I looked at my companions, and they weren't listening. <laughs> they had cameras in their hands, and one guy is looking at aperture settings, and the other fellow is looking at shutter speeds, <laughs> and they're looking out at the moon. I said, gentlemen, what are your plans here? They said, well, Jim, as we round the back side of the moon, the far side, we're going to take pictures. <laughs> and I said, if we don't get home, you won't get them developed. <laughs> well, they took their pictures. We finally got our act together. Two hours after we left the back side, we lit the descent engine for the second time, left it on for four and a half minutes, pushed us faster and faster and faster back home. And when it shut off, we turned off all those exotic equipments in the lunar module to save electrical power, the guidance system, the computer, the autopilot. The only thing we had working for us was a little fan to circulate the atmosphere and the radio to talk back home. And you know, when you're in a tight spot and there's really nothing to do and everything is quiet, that's bad news. You start to think. And I think it was Swiker that said, you know, we might be exceeding escape velocity. <laughs> I said, you would have to bring that up. <laughs> and he says, if we miss the atmosphere coming back in, we'll, of course, escape from the Earth, and, you know, that means going into an orbit about the sun. I said, oh, fine. <laughs> the ground called up and said, we've been tracking you on radar, and you guys are really hauling the mail. <laughs> well, you know, to make a reentry here on the Earth, you have to come into a two-degree pie-shaped wedge. If you come in too shallow, you skip out like skipping a stone on water. If you come in too steep, you're a fire meteor for a few brief seconds over the night sky. We were coming in on that free return course, we hoped, into that pie-shaped wedge. At 102 hours after we took off on this wonderful mission, the ground called up and said, we've been tracking you in our large radars, and we don't know what happened. You're probably still venting something, but you're no longer on the free return course. I said, well, thank you very much. I said, we turned off the computer. We turned off the guidance system. We have turned off all those exotic things to help us get back home. You don't know what our attitude is. 
uh, we don't know really, you know, how to make a maneuver to get back into that corridor. They said, Jim, do you remember on Apollo 8 what we had in the back of our flight manual? Those emergency procedures because we were not too sure about the navigation system or the communication system. And these backup procedures were in the back of your flight manual that if prayers fail to help you, this is what you had to use. And I said, I recall those. And I think Frank does too. But I said, after 8, we decided that we'll never have to use them. I mean, we, we never have to train for redundancy or, or double failures or things like that. So we took them out of the flight manuals from Apollo 9 on up. They said you'd have to use them now. What that consisted of was trying to manually maneuver this combination around, putting the Earth in the window of the lunar module. We had a little gun sight there. If I could put the, the terminator between the daylight and the darkness horizontal with the horizontal line of my little reticle or gun sight, that would then place the descent engine in a position to either shallow up or, or steepen up the angle, depending on whether I had daylight or darkness at the top of my window. And I had to do it at exactly the proper time on the way home. Brown said, well, we're going to try this out back in the simulators to see if this thing really works. <laughs> but be ready to copy. A little while later, they came up and said, ready to copy. And I said, fine. There wasn't a camera to be seen. These guys are serious now. <laughs> we jotted down the information. Proper time. I said, Jack, I said, you know, the, the clock is not running. You've got a wristwatch. You time to burn. I said, Fred, I know that when the engine goes on full blast, because there wasn't any throttle up or anything like that, no autopilot. I said, I don't think I'll be able to keep the earth in the window in all three axes. You take the backup hand controller, and you keep the earth from going back and forth too much. I'll take the prime and keep it from going up and down too much. I had two buttons over in the side of my console. One said start, and one said stop. These were the emergency electrical connections from the battery to the decent engine. I think the only time they were ever used in the program. At the proper time, Jack said start. I hit the start button. The engine went on full blast. I jockeyed the Earth vertically, Fred jockeyed it horizontally. Fourteen seconds later, Jack said, stop, and we stopped. And then we waited to see if we'd gotten back in that quarter, and the, of course the ground was tracking us. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't think that I would be here today if that maneuver wasn't successful. It was, and of course, the landing was successful. We call this flight a successful failure. It was a failure in all aspects of what we look at here at NASA. But in one respect, it was a tremendous success as the competency and the technical capability of the contractors and NASA personnel to take a real-time emergency, develop procedures in a time, real-time, to get us back home safely. So you all should be proud of getting the Apollo 13 spacecraft back. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. He makes it sound humorous, but there weren't very many of us laughing for four days. Well, th since we didn't get to Frau Morrow then, we thought we ought to try it again. Al Shepard. Uh, thank you, Jim. Since we don't have a break scheduled in the program, I don't mind donating a minute or two of my time if you all want to stand and stretch and give me a standing ovation. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Jim, I want to tell you that I really appreciate that, that short uh, but brilliant introduction. Actually, and I normally am introduced uh, with a, at least a fair reading of my biography. <laughs> I remember on one occasion a number of years ago when John Glenn and I were appearing on the same program. And I was introduced... Uh, well, as a matter of fact, it was back in the old days when, uh, when I was famous and he wasn't. <laughs> Introduced in the rather glowing introduction ending in the remark, one of the few truly great living Americans. 
And when the fellow said it, it sounded pretty good. And uh, as a matter of fact, the more I thought about it, the better it sounded. <laughs> we were going back to the airport. I turned to John. I said, uh, you know, John, when you come to think about it, there really are not very many truly great living Americans. He looked at me in total disgust and said, yes, Alan, and there's just one less than you think. <laughs> We had a lot of fun those days. Some of you may remember that we flew a monkey, and, uh, and then I flew the following uh, flight, 61. And, and Glenn uh, flew the next year, and he sometimes takes uh, great pleasure in introducing me as the link between monkey and man. <laughs> of course, I've uh, taken several opportunities to point out to him that I don't think he's made the complete transition. <laughs> I guess uh, probably I'm the only guy here who has tenure before 1962, so I thought I'd talk about a few moments of ancient history. Of course, perhaps the, the most burning question I've heard all my life is, how come you were first to fly in space? Well, actually, as I told you, in the spring of 61, we flew ham on a redstone, perfect uh, redstone flight, but at the cutoff, the escape tower took off as scheduled, but it still had the capsule attached to it, so ham got a jolt, and. Uh, went 20 miles higher and 50 miles further, and he bounced around the ocean for quite a long time and uh, took him down to recover him. He was supposed to fly again the next month. They couldn't get him back in the capsule. <laughs> it was on a Saturday afternoon. I was the only guy in the ready room. <laughs> Had a neat flight on the, on the Redstone, and I went to Washington and uh, got a medal and parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. And I thought I was pretty smart, maybe even smarter than Ham, until about three months, three months later I found out that he went to a stud farm for the rest of his natural life. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what you call natural life. I'd like to, uh, it is a pleasure to be here to rep to, today to represent Apollo 14. Uh, I'm sorry Stu couldn't be here. He sends his regards. Uh, the uh, beer at happy hour is going to be Coors and it's free. <laughs> and uh, Ed uh, Mitchell also sends his regards, but as you know, Ed talks in a different frequency and uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that the uh, ESP is uh, working today. Uh, some of you may not remember that the Apollo 14 was labeled the all-rookie crew. Uh, of course, Stu had not flown before, and uh, Ed had not flown before, and I understand Pete Conrad doesn't think 16 minutes of sober flight qualifies for anything. <laughs> Nonetheless, there we were, the three rookies. Um, and I think that uh, perhaps at this point, before I really get into the details of, of that marvelous flight, um, to mention that I, in fact, have a 16 millimeter film here, which I uh, acquired from the Air Force. Uh, it's a highly confidential film. Uh, it goes back uh, a number of years uh, before shredding machines. <laughs> and I thought you might enjoy seeing a film that, uh, that no one has, not too many people have seen before. If you want to roll it, if the soundtrack works, I hope it does. If it doesn't, I got a few more jokes. Can you kill the front? Yeah, thanks. This is the lighthouse at Cape Canaveral. Built in 1867, it has been guiding ships safely past the Cape for nearly 100 years, long before missiles began to grace the scene. The view from the top is beautiful. From its 165-foot high vantage point, one can see for miles in every direction. Here, a sergeant, with some spare time on his hands, has decided to drink in a panoramic view from the top.
That was a fine shot, but then I guess you've had plenty of experience. No, uh, that was my first shot. I'm really a, a lighthouse keeper. But I like to think for myself. I tell you, you young guys, things are really tough in those days. <laughs> Actually, uh, perhaps some of you also realize that, uh, that I'm the oldest man that ever walked on the moon, and uh, that probably doesn't have any special significance until you realize that uh, we did have, in fact, to walk, and uh, we didn't have those fancy electric automobiles that these, some of these guys had uh, later on. I don't think that they would be willing to admit that, that to, at this point, to even that uh, Apollo 14 lighted the closest to the target of any of the six missions, the lunar missions. Uh, there'd be no quarrel about the fact that we brought back the oldest rocks ever brought back from the surface of the moon. And uh, we came closest to the uh, recovery point uh, at the end of the mission in the Pacific Ocean. As a matter of fact, it was very close to a perfect flight. <laughs> Which is not too surprising for three rookies. Uh, almost dull and really uh, boring, uh, except that in fact, uh, uh, just by unhappy circumstance, it was punctuated by four moments of stark terror and one golf shot. <laughs> we'll talk briefly about the moments of stark terror. It had to do with uh, shortly after lunar insertion, translunar insertion. Uh, Sue Russo was then flying the command module. He was going to do a turnaround, come back in and dock with the lunar module, pull it out. And Sue was going to establish the world's record on the least amount of fuel used during the, during the transposition and docking maneuver. And boy, he had worked so hard, and bless his heart, he did a heck of a job. He, we flew off, and he turned around, flew back in, and just about in the final approach, he'd probably only used about two teacups of uh, RCS and moved smoothly in. The docking probe went into the, uh, into the uh, drogue. Right in the center, we bounced back out again. Did it again. Several times, I won't bore you with the number of times that we did it. I won't bore you with the conversations went back and forth between us and the ground. Uh, consternation, and uh, we were saying, oh, God, it's Apollo 13 all over again without the lunar module. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, the thing finally worked. Well, then we said, well, we pulled it on in, looked at it, couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then we had to convince the folks that, that we'd be allowed to go ahead because the docking probe and the drug had to be used for take off and recovery from the lunar surface. Uh, I think we finally solved the argument. We said, well, now, don't worry about it. We're going to go down there and land. We're going to take off and rendezvous, and we're just going to fly station, and we're going to do an EVA transfer with the rocks, and we don't need the docking probe. Well, I think that finally got everybody organized back on the Earth, and so we, they said, okay, go ahead and go. Uh, it then, then we went uh, into the lunar orbit. We had a little problem with... Uh, with the, uh, with the uh, software program and the uh, onboard main computer in the lunar module, that uh, before you go down, you actually disconnect it from the autopilot, send it on down uh, in simulation, and see if it works all right. Well, the thing started down, came right back in orbit again. They immediately confused us of having our thumb on the abort button, which is ridiculous because it's a big red button inside of God and everybody with a big plastic cover on the top of it. Uh, we, we chose to uh, discard that particular solution to the problem and realized finally that something in fact had closed the switch. So they woke up a young, nice young man up in uh, MIT that wrote the software program about three o'clock in the morning and he came down and made some squiggles on a few pieces of paper and, uh, and sent it down and tried the simulator and sure enough sent it up to us and uh, we tried it and it worked and fine so we were on our way again and another, another hairbreadth uh, Harry escape. Uh, I guess perhaps the thing that uh, was the, uh, the most exciting for me was uh, during the descent, the point where the landing radar is supposed to come in and update the, the primary navigational system. Uh, and um, it's supposed to do it uh, by a certain time. 
Well, we were starting down. The landing radar was supposed to come in and wasn't coming in, and we're getting all kinds of comments from down here in the control center. Of course, we, we could tell that landing radar wasn't working very well. Uh, and uh, finally, some bright guy said, well, pull the circuit breaker out and stick it back in on the landing radar. So we pulled the circuit breaker out and stuck it back in. Sure enough, pretty soon the landing radar came in, and, and just about in time for us to, uh, to make the minimum altitude. Well, we went on down, landed, and sat there, wiped the sweat off our brows collectively, uh, respectively, and and uh, Ed said, uh, he said, Al, what were you going to do if uh, the landing radar hadn't come in on time? I said, Ed, you'll never know. <laughs> Just a little quick uh, to do about the, uh, oh, I know what I was going to tell you about. We had the first EVA, and of course we had a little bit less oxygen than the, the first, uh, the two missions, and so we had to rush out and had to rush back, and we didn't have enough time in between to take the suits off. They did let us take the helmets and the, and the gloves off and said, okay, now you guys have got a few hours to go to sleep. So uh, we had a hammock on the bottom for Ed, who was a junior officer, slept down below. <laughs> and being the uh, senior officer, I had the swing of the hammock up on the, on the top, and we got in our hammocks, struggled to get in our hammocks, turned the lights off, put the screens up over the window, total darkness, and, and tried to sleep. Neck rings, wrist rings. Not very much sleep going on. I guess we were dozing off, and all of a sudden the whole limb vibrated, a tremendous clang. And I said, hey, Ed, did you hear that? <laughs> he said, yeah, what was it? <laughs> now, all of a sudden I thought to myself, we are two grown men who were 234,000 miles, 230,000 miles away from Earth who were whispering to each other. <laughs> I said, my God, you don't suppose we're tipping over? Well, God, I was, he said, we had, had to look. So I'm getting out of the top hammock, and I'm falling on Ed, and Ed's trying out of the bottom, bottom hammock, and it's, you know, asses and elbows. And finally got to the point we tore down the shades in there. We sat absolutely uh, five degrees right wing down, which is exactly where we landed. And uh, we talked about that a long time and finally figured out it must have been something that, some valve that had, had, uh, had actuated and it just happened to be in the natural frequency of that great uh, Grumman birdcage. I'm not quite sure what the natural frequency of the great uh, Grumman birdcage is, but I know that Ed and I are not tenors, so obviously we weren't in that, in that frequency. I did have a lot of fun with the golf, just a couple of quick inside stories on that. Uh, as you, some of you may know, that it was really all very well planned and, uh, and thought out ahead of time, practiced in the suit room with the, with the makeshift golf club and everything. But I had not told too many people. As a matter of fact, I had not told, uh, told uh, Mitchell that. And we're on the way up there. And I said, you know, when we get to the time, we're going to have a little fun in uh, lunar gravity. I'm going to whack a couple of golf balls. And he said, geez, you tell anybody about that? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I talked to the boss, at Gil Ruth, and I told him that the things were all screwed up there that uh, on the surface that I wouldn't uh, fool with it because we could be accused of being frivolous, wasting taxpayers' money and so on. And so uh, he said if things were not going well that I wouldn't do it, but if things are going fine, then I would go ahead and, and uh, hit these two golf balls. So he said, oh, that's nice. And a few minutes later he said, he said, look, we're going to be up there in the moon a quarter million miles away. He said, why did you bother to tell Gilruth? <laughs> I said, Ed, the thought occurred to me that he still has to sign a paychecks when he got back home. <laughs> anyway, I, I felt badly about not, not telling Ed uh, about the golf shot ahead of time, but I suppose that uh, all, my, uh, all my feelings about that were, were uh, quickly uh, vanished when I got back in three days after I landed in, uh, in quarantine and found out that Ed had ran an ESP experiment with some guy in Chicago and didn't tell, him about, it didn't tell me about it. I was so mad at that point, I figured it would have, I would have been happier if he'd uh, taken some first day covers up and sold them to the Germans when he came back. <laughs> My comment was, uh, was uh, Ed, if you were so damn good on this ESP, how come you didn't tell me on the lunar surface not to worry that we're going to make it back safely? <laughs> Just a couple of uh, quick, quick serious thoughts. Uh, you know, it's, it's fun to get excited uh, about the 20th anniversary of the lunar landing. Um, we sense it among ourselves. We sense it among those of you who have worked with us. Uh, 
We sense it among the general public because it is, in fact, exciting after 20 years to think about men going to the moon and back. Uh, it's exciting uh, to think about men taking spacewalks. It's exciting to think about uh, people going to Mars, uh, doing, doing things on the, on the moon, on the lunar surface uh, in the days ahead. But you know, um, as exciting as it is, and as, and as many uh, Walter Mitty's as there are out there about this great emotional uh, business of being in space, it doesn't always guarantee uh, that you're going to get dollars to do the job. And I sense that uh, perhaps all of us who believe very strongly in the, in the program can, sure, we can speculate and, and uh, we can postulate about uh, which is the best way to go to get to Mars, uh, the, the methods and means of doing it. But I think we probably will do ourselves a greater service uh, if we can talk a little bit more about spin-off. If we can somehow keep the public aware of all the great things that have happened to them over the years because of space and space technology. Now, it's not an easy story to tell. It never has been an easy story to tell because there's nothing exciting about space spinoff unless you happen to have been affected uh, directly and personally. And we know, as we know, many of the people in the country today have been affected directly and personally by the marvelous things that we all have created with space technology. I suggest, uh, perhaps um, as dull as it may be to talk about, to talk about uh, transfer of technology, that, that maybe we're going to do ourselves a favor if we emphasize the positive things that have happened, the positive things the space program has meant to us over the years. They've got a half a dozen things, things that you know strike a little chord with somebody. And say, oh yeah, you know, that's, that's really true after all. I mean, because we can sit here and argue about, well, we can, instead of spending the dollars going into space, we can, uh, you know, we can worry about poverty and the hardships uh, here on the, on the uh, surface of the moon, uh, surface of the earth. And I don't have to tell you people here, particularly in this area, what would happen to, in terms of hardships and poverty if the space budget were, were cut in half. So uh, let's emphasize the positive things and, and positive things that we can talk to about people in a language they'll understand. So in fact, they will be happy to, in between these high emotional periods, they will be happy to uh, to support what we believe and what we know is the way to go. I just want to uh, take this point in closing to, uh, to thank you for a couple of, uh, couple of great trips in space. I uh, was looking at some clips the other day of, uh, the, of the moment in Washington after Freedom 7 when I was given the medal, and I, I spoke at that time that uh, I was aware of the fact that all the accolades and, and praises that I was receiving really belonged to the thousands of people that, that uh, made things work. Certainly, I felt the same after uh, Apollo 14, and, and we all don't have the chance to uh, express that too much. I'm not given to too much milk of human kindness, as you well know. And uh, I think it's important for, for you to realize that we do appreciate what you've done. We do appreciate the effort, the dedication, and motivation that it takes. And for Ed and for Stu, uh, we thank you. Let me just say one thing in closing, uh, in thanking you, that things are not always easy. I mean, looking back over a couple of, of uh, bad times over the last uh, 29 years, uh, but it's important for you to, uh, to stay on your toes. Don't get back on your heels. Uh, We've done so well in the past. Just hang in there, and the next 20 are going to be even better. Thank you. Frank and Gene and I have been sitting there saying, did you know that happened? No, oh, did you know that happened? Well, there's one thing that probably Shepard doesn't know that happened, that I know how far he hit the golf ball. Uh, he came back with these grand and glorious uh, uh, descriptions of the golf ball flying practically over the horizon. As I recall, I think he said it made one orbit. Uh, you know, and the gravity is only one sixth what it ought to be uh, on, the, on the moon and what it is on the Earth, which means it ought to go, a ball ought to go about six times further. So a guy can hit a 200 yard drive or 300 yard drive, can drive 1,200 or 1,500 yards up on the moon. Well, uh, Al was supposed to take some pictures of the lunar surface as soon as he landed, and he did. There was a panorama. And then at the end of his first EVA, there was another panorama. And then at the end of his last EVA, there was another panorama. And one of the 
the prototype called me over one day. I was the program manager then and said, I want to show you something. He had a map out and he said, you see, this is where the TV camera was and this is where Shepard was standing when he hit the golf ball. I want to show you some pictures. And he showed me these pictures. He said, see that crater? What's in it? There was nothing in it. That was the first picture. Second picture, there was nothing in it. Third picture, there was a little white speck in it. I said, what do you think that is? I said, um, I think it's a golf ball. What do you think it is? He says, it is the golf ball. We measured it off with about 50 feet. <laughs> Uh, the last three missions had the benefit of the equipment that was designed at about the time that we landed on the moon the first time. A uh, big uh, electric rover, a, a TV camera that could be run from the ground, uh, uh, ability to stay on the lunar surface much longer, measured in days instead of hours, and, and equipment that was up in the service module that could look down on the moon. Let's talk about the first uh, J mission, Jim Irwin. Thank you, Jim. It's great to, to be here this afternoon. It was almost 18 years ago that Dave Scott and Al Warden and I were here for our press conference. And I, I don't think we had nearly the uh, crowd that we have this afternoon. And the spirit was much different. It was very strict, rather quiet. And uh, I've just enjoyed this afternoon so much because I've learned so much more about the Apollo program. And I'm sure that you have, too, because things have been revealed this afternoon I don't think the world knows. And I know, uh, you know, we were the backup crew for Apollo 12, Dave Scott, Al Warden, and I. And uh, I think one of our most important functions as the backup crew was producing that film that you saw. That Al said, what would be the reaction of world leaders if they saw that film? Well, we might know that tonight, Al. And I'll be wondering what the reaction is as they see that film. But it was wonderful to be their backup crew. It was wonderful to be on the, the prime crew for Apollo 15. As, as Jim told you, there was, uh, well, there was a cancellation of three Apollo flights, and so they decided to delay ours slightly so we could have uh, more advanced equipment, that we could have a a lunar module that could stay on the surface for three days. We could have a little automobile. Uh, Dave and I were both interested in sporting activities, and we wanted to uh, introduce some other sports other than just golfing. Dave wanted to introduce baseball. I loved to play tennis and ski. I thought, boy, that'd be perfect on the moon. But there was some adverse reaction to Al's uh, hitting the golf ball up there, so they said, no more of that sporting activity. This is all business. You go there as professionals, scientific. And so we're labeled as the first extended scientific to the mission to the moon. And uh, we did, well, as far as first, first to spend three days on the surface, uh, first to take the little automobile, and uh, we had some advanced equipment in our command module, which will bring a lot of new data in back to uh, plan future missions to the moon. So uh, about 18 years ago, Apollo 15 went into space. I did bring a few slides uh, from our flight. Unfortunately, I didn't bring the, uh, don't think we have the patch of Apollo 15, but uh, let's uh, see the first slide. It's labeled uh, Apollo 15 is struck by lightning. Uh, there was a, a lot of concern about lightning strikes, particularly after Apollo 12 was struck uh, you know, shortly after their liftoff. And there were a lot of thunderstorms at the Cape that summer of 71. And the night before, Apollo 15 was struck by lightning. But fortunately, the next morning, it cleared, and we had a perfect weather conditions, and we had a perfect launch. The next slide, I think, shows the, uh, the Earth, and we've all been impressed with this view of the Earth. And uh, I think uh, our lives will never be the same because we've had that rare opportunity to see the Earth from far away. The next slide, I think we sh actually, uh, well, you probably all remember well that we were there to explore the mountains of the moon, the Apennine Mountains, the 
highest mountains really on the front side of the moon. And then the scientists were also interested in the nature of this canyon, Hadley Rill. We landed at a place called Hadley Base. In fact, well, Hadley was the British astronomer who developed the sextant. Many of the features in that area were named for Hadley. There was Hadley Mountain, Mount Hadley Delta, Hadley Canyon, Hadley Crater. Everything was named for Hadley to the point where we thought we were in British territory. But it was a beautiful place to land. Next slide will show uh, the view to the south. Uh, to uh, This is Mount Hadley Delta. When we landed, you probably recall that for the first time there was a stand-up EVA where the top hatch was open and, and Dave Scott being a a West Point graduate, a, I think a frustrated tank commander, was able to stand there and make his views of the moon and his observations, which were greatly appreciated. And he described this view out as he looked to the south to see a mountain that was, this was 13,000 feet high, Mount Hadley Delta. And uh, after we finally got out on the surface and did drive over to that mountain, we found uh, many interesting rocks, including the white rock that the press labeled the Genesis rock. Next slide is the uh, view, and it's a little washed out. I'm sorry, this is a view to the north of our site, and this is Mount Hadley, and it's actually 15,000 feet high from the base to the top. Unfortunately, in this view, you cannot see the unusual layering that's very obvious in the mountain, and I know that layering, what appears to be layering, is still a controversial point. And so that, that controversy still exists. Uh, next slide, uh, the, uh, some of the rocks that we found as we returned on our second EVA, uh, clearly vesicles, large cavities in the rocks. And these are the first ones that we saw on while we were there on the surface. Next slide is, uh, well, we spent three days there. We did take some new equipment, and this is a picture that I took of Dave when he was uh, getting ready to do the, uh, the lunar drill operation to take the temperature of the moon, the heat flow experiment, experiment. It's experience, experiment. Well, you know, he drilled down about 10 feet and placed, got a core sample, also placed a thermometer there so we were able to record the heat flow coming out of the moon, which was a, a, a new experiment. It was also a very trying experiment because, you know, it, he tried to get the, uh, the core sample out that was down 10 feet in, into the surface, and, and it took the efforts of both of us to finally unwedge it and, and get it out. But we did place this new ex experiment on the surface. The next slide is the, uh, the little automobile in the background, Mount Hadley, which is 15,000 feet high. Next slide, uh, the ditch that was dug. I had the opportunity to dig the ditch. I have the distinction of being the first ditch digger on the moon. And I did have great difficulty. If you remember the pictures then, I probably looked like a cat, uh, tried to digging a hole. And it was, it was, frankly, it was very difficult, but when I got down to about one foot, it was a very resistant layer, couldn't go any deeper. But we got a lot of information from this experiment, soil mechanics experiment. Next slide, the photograph that I took of Dave Scott. I was very proud of that photograph. I thought Dave should be right in the center of it. He was our commander. And it's used sometimes, but the one that they use the very most now around the world is the next photograph, the one that Dave took of me. And you can see why they use that, because it shows the car. And Dave is a better photographer. We called the lunar module the Falcon because we are all Air Force crew to fly together in space. I thought that was true until I saw Al Shepard's film, and I realized that that sergeant was really the first all Air Force fly, flight in space. So I'll have to modify my story. But this photograph is regarded as the very best, and I, I'm glad that I just happened to be in it. The next photograph is uh, 
the final resting place of Rover One, and it's still sitting there uh, on the highest used car lot in the world. We recommend it for your use. If you don't have a chance to go to the moon, maybe your children or your grandchildren will go there, and they can use it as a little car. You don't even need keys to turn it on. You just turn the switch on and hope the batteries are still hot. And on the control pedestal of this little car, Dave Scott left uh, a Bible, a red leather Bible. You can just see it there on the control pedestal. And not too many people know that, that it's there. Next slide is uh, the view of our campsite for three days. Next slide is a photograph that we took as we were just closing in on the Endeavor. And you can see the scientific bay that was there that kept Al very busy while he was there for those three days all by himself. I don't see how he did it all by himself, because when we came up there, we complicated the thing so much that it almost failed to work. So he did very much better by himself than when we came in to help him. Next slide is the, uh, of course, the sub-satellite. We also uh, deployed the first sub-satellite to circle the moon. It operated, as you know, about eight months, then finally struck the surface. But in the meantime, it had sent back a lot of new information about the moon. The next one, coming back. And also another first, first mission to lose a chute. So we were coming down very fast, wondering would the spacecraft survive the impact? Would we survive the impact? A lot of thoughts racing through our mind. We really couldn't communicate. I was responsible for reading the checklist. And I had difficulty reading the checklist because the helicopter crew that was circling us kept saying, fellows, don't worry about it. You're going to be all right. But they kept repeating themselves so much, I really wondered if they knew what they were talking about. So we were coming down on two shoots and a prayer, but finally we hit the water and we did survive, and Apollo 15 was home. And that was the, the first mission to take the automobile. Well, it was a great experience to participate in the mission of Apollo. I think when we came to that press conference here 18 years ago, Dave Scott ended that press conference with a quote from the famous philosopher Plutarch, and he said, the mine is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. And so I hope that the, the spirit of Apollo will live and will continue. And I think that Apollo means Apollo was the god of light. And so, indeed, I hope that Apollo brought new light to the people of the Earth so that, indeed, we can regard the Earth differently, we can regard ourselves differently. And we have been enriched by that experience. I know I have been enriched, and I've been trying to share that enrichment with the people of the Earth ever since. So our lives were changed. I hope your lives were changed, that we've all benefited. I do want to point out one other thing before I sit down, and that is the, the very rare situation that the next one who will speak, my friend John Young. But John Young and I went to the same junior high school down in Orlando, Memorial Junior High School. And then we ended up on the moon in the very same order that we were in school. Isn't that remarkable? Apollo is remarkable. Thank you. something every day. I thought they both flunked in your high school. <laughs> the next landing point was Descartes, John Young. It's a great honor to be here to talk about the Apollo 16 uh, second exploration and discovery mission on the moon. I have a little talk here. It's going to take quite a while. It is wonderful to be here. I uh, would like to talk to you about the second J mission, Exploration and Discovery on the Moon. It was a lot of fun. Show the first slide. Well, as everyone knows, if you're going to go to the moon, you've got to have something like this. You've got to have 
You may have to focus those slides because uh, they're 20 years old. You got to have something like that to do it with. Um, and you also need 400,000 good people to do it with, and many of those are in this audience right today. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, thanks a lot. Sitting on the top of that critter are three very nervous people. Charlie Duke, Ken Mattingly, and me. People said that when that vehicle left the ground, it shook so much that the ground vibrated. You couldn't prove it by me. I was sitting in the top of it. I think my knees were shaking, but there again, it was vibrating so much you couldn't tell. Next slide. We're very soon, we're on our way to the moon. This is uh, the Earth about a thousand miles up right after we fired our rocket engines to go to the moon. For the flat Earth people in the audience, you can see what's going to happen. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Next slide. This is like Jim's uh, view of the Earth, and people say this view has changed the way we think about Earth. I guess uh, they're very worried about the environment and planet Earth, but probably what we ought to worry when we get smart enough to do it is how we're treating planet Earth. Planet Earth has gotten rid of a lot of human survivors so far, a lot of species, and, and uh, it's a real survivor. So if we're not careful how we treat it, we may be the next to go. But I'll tell you, when we were going to the moon, we had sort of a different view of this. We looked out the window, and the Earth was in our window just like that in the, blue, in the black, black ground, and it started to get flat. You no longer saw it in three dimensions. It's about that time when you're going to the moon I personally and the other fellows that were with me, we started to wonder if we hadn't bitten off more than we could chew. Next slide. We finally did get into orbit around the moon. Ken Mattingly is in, the Ryan, is in Snoopy over there. And we're in the Orion, and Charlie Duke took this picture. And that's what you can see when you get on the moon. The Earth is 230 or 40,000 miles away. And when you hold up your thumb like this, you can... You can only see the blue clouds, the blue surface and the, and the clouds, and you can hold up your thumb and cover up the earth. And if that doesn't worry you, why, well, nothing ever will. <laughs> Next slide. This is our landing site at Descartes. It's a very interesting place. We landed up there a long time ago, and there were some very interesting things that uh, went on up there. We had to name all these unnamed craters so we know where we were. We landed uh, southeast of Palmetto so we could go out to Flag Crater out here and then down south to Stone Mountain and climb up that mountain there and then up to Northray Crater up there. And uh, nobody had any good maps of this place and uh, Stu Russo on Al Shepard's 14 flight took those pictures. When we got, when we got to study it real close, they looked at it with radar and they said you had nine foot to 15 foot scarps in the area. I said, you mean we can drive the rover off a nine foot w wall, sort of, in the area? And they said, yes. And I said, I hope it has good shock. <laughs> Next slide. This is a jump and salute to the flag on the moon that Charlie Duke took this picture. And what it shows is, uh, is a lot of things. There's the lunar rover, and there's the flag. And uh, I don't know if you can really tell or not, but on the Earth, with that, all that equipment on and a backpack, we weighed 360 pounds. We trained in, trained in Earth at the block fields, as you saw in that film, a lot. And you could barely move your big troll. But when you're on the moon, and one, you only weighed 60 pounds, so the jump was delightful. That hill in the background is Stone Mountain that I told you about. It's about 1,200 feet high. And it's about two miles away. It's kind of hard to tell, because there are no telephone poles up there. I mean, none up there yet. <laughs> Next slide. This is the lunar surface uh, equipment that we set up up there, the Lunar Science Station. Right here in the foreground is the magnetometer. We found that the uh, moon had a higher uh, ancient magnetic field than was first believed with that. In the back there is the uh, seismometer. We found that the moon was receiving uh, moon, moon quakes and impacts at the rate of more than 3,000 per year. There's a radioactive thermal generator right there and a lunar science station right there. The radioactive thermal generator powered that lunar science station, which sent back new knowledge to planet Earth through that in little bitty antenna up there. 
for five years after Charlie and I left from up there. All those rocks in the foreground, and we picked up a whole bunch of them and brought them back, they're totally different than the rocks that people had predicted we'd find up there. So when you're into exploration and discovery missions, sometimes you get surprised. Next slide. This right here is the first telescope on the moon. Notice I said first telescope. The moon is a heck of a good place to do astronomy. It's a very stable place, has two weeks of night, and of course the cold temperatures allow you to have uh, real good infrared astronomy sensors. Next slide. This is a picture we took of planet Earth. These oxygen, uh, these blue lines around here are oxygen-rich aurora belts of uh, planet Earth. That was an ultraviolet picture enhanced, and it shows that the uh, good old Earth, uh, people thought originally that some of that oxygen might have to do with getting life started on planet Earth. You learn something new every time you fly. Next slide. This good old rover, you've seen pictures of it before, is a very reliable machine. Uh, the tires were made of piano wire. They couldn't even leak. And uh, the thing about the rover was that uh, when you drove it along, it was a real lightweight vehicle about like a Jeep. It bounced up and down at one six gravity, and the tires would slide out. And if you cut the wheels too sharp, it would go backwards. And you just slide out backwards like driving on ice. What saved Charlie and me was it's not like NASA 1. There's nobody coming from the other direction. <laughs> Al said we should talk about spinoffs. The handle in there stop, go, left, right, and brakes and set brakes all in one handle. Now it'll allow very disabled people to drive safely. Next slide. This is the ascent stage uh, sitting on the moon just before lunar liftoff. Uh, the, top, the top part of that machine goes, and the bottom part stays on the surface. That's very interesting, too. We know that there are 200 ways that the lunar module engine could fail to start. It was a pretty tense time. Think of that, 200 ways to become the first permanently manned lunar base. <laughs> Next slide. This is right after ascent stage liftoff, and right there is the descent stage, and back there is the rover. And if you look real close, you can see tire tracks and footprints all over the place. But if we accept the uh, thing that the president said we would do, more human solar system exploration, you know, it won't be too many years before somebody would be wanting to pave a lunar freeway right through this place. Next slide. This is a big picture of the moon. And uh, I, I got it because I like to show you these uh, scallop craters with these crater rays moving out like this and then moving in this direction right here. It's a beautiful picture of those basalt, dark basalt flats of the basalt seas. And of course, these are the highlands in the background. And the moon is mostly highland. There's a great variety of rocks on the moon. People have to take look up close up and get a good feel for it. Next slide. I always like to show this slide because here's the lunar module Orion just before we're docking with Snoopy returned to Earth. But if you can see, there are those two slides, there are those two crater rays in the background. I like to show this slide because a lot of people think that we went, did all this moon work in a secret movie lot in Arizona. And it's proof positive that we were there. And of course, I have the gray hairs and so does Charlie Duke to prove that we were up there. Next slide. This is a big picture of the moon taken on Apollo 10. I'd just like to say in defense of the moon, it's not a little place, it's a big place. It's got uh, one-fourth the land surface area of the whole world. Maybe you're looking at a place as big as uh, North America in this slide right here. Uh, it's uh, some kind of place, and I think, just as Jack Smith said Monday, it's going to be the bridge to the solar system. It's going to be a wonderful place to start from, and I don't think we should even start there, stop there. It's an outstanding uh, place to get started. It has a great gravity field, doesn't have any air, got different kinds of rocks, and for all anybody knows, it has no water unless you're ingenious, and it has more water than you know what to do with. Next slide. This is my friend Bob McCall's wonderful uh, painting that he did for the National Commission on Space. I couldn't talk about 20 years ago all, all day. I had to talk about 20 years from now. This is a moon base, what I call moon base 2000. I know it won't look like this. But the idea is right, and what you see here is a lot of people hard working have put up all this equipment on the moon. Will they really do that? Well, not without a lot of technical breakthroughs, some of which will be made by you right here in this audience. I think uh, after the president said, 
we had space station freedom, then on to the moon, then to Mars and beyond, he said something that no president ever said before. It's probably uh, the second step after space station freedom or something like it. It'll really be a contribution. Next slide. This beautiful picture of planet Earth was made uh, by Ken Manningly as we uh, left the surface uh, 12,000 miles up on the way. It's probably the best handheld picture ever made of the United States. You can see there's the west coast all the way up to Seattle. There's the Mississippi Basin all the way up to Lake Superior, Lake Michigan. The whole east coast, and of course, Texas is wide open. There's the White Sands, New Mexico, where we've landed the space shuttle. But what this picture really shows is the people, just like yourselves, that have made the contributions to, the, to our space program, the people who are going to continue to do that big job in the future. We're going to be doing a lot of exploration and discovery in the future, like the President says, and I think it's really important. Why are we into this? Well, there's going to be a lot of fun involved, as you heard here today, but it really isn't all going to be fun. People are into exploration and discovery. The human species is so they can make the world a better place for the future, the future that involves their children and their grandchildren, so that life for them can be more challenging and more satisfying. That's what exploration and discovery is all about. And, uh, up till about yesterday, I was really worried about what we're going to do. I'm not so worried anymore. I think it's going to be a great future for us in the space program. I think we should all be looking forward to it. And by gosh, thank you all for your contribution. Thank you, John. One of the major benefits of being the commander of a crew is you always got to talk first, and you knew what you're going to say. The, the poor second or third guy never knew what the first or second guy was going to say, so he was always kind of have to be very quick on his feet with his words. Well, we've got one of those guys with us today. Uh, Gene Cernan is going to talk last. He's going to wrap this thing up. He landed at Taurus Liftoff. Gene? Good training being commander of Apollo 17. That was the last flight to the moon. But following these guys uh, here this afternoon is sort of by, like being uh, Elizabeth Taylor's seventh uh, husband. I know what to do. I'm not sure I can make it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get one thing squared away. I've got a few slides I want to take you very quickly uh, through Apollo 17. But uh, I want to get something squared away very, very quickly. No one will ever forget, and of course we've been reminded over and over again, uh, Neil's first words on the surface of the moon. But not many people remember man's last words on the surface of the moon. Uh, just in case any of you play Trivia Pursuit, so you do have the right answer, I'm going to give you those words right now. We were sitting in the lunar module about 20 seconds before liftoff, and I looked over at Jack and I said, Jack, let's get this mother out of here. <laughs> and when Al Shepard so uh, subtly asked for his standing ovation, it reminded me of a quick story I'm going to tell you uh, in, a, in, a, in just a couple of minutes. On Apollo 10, uh, my daughter, w well, she was three when I flew the first time, six when I flew the second time, nine for Apollo 17. Three's too young, nine she was part of it, but six is, you know, is, is right in the middle. We lived right across the street over here in, uh, in Nassau Bay, and about a month before Apollo 10, before we were ever, uh, before we were going to go to the moon, I took Tracy out in the backyard, six-year-old little girl, and I said, Tracy, you know what that is? And she looks up at me, and she says, Daddy, and I said, Tracy, that's the moon. And I said, Tracy, you know how far that is? And she said, Daddy, that's, and I said, Tracy, the moon is way out in heaven with God. And I said, Tracy, do you know if anyone has ever gone to the moon? And she says, Daddy. And I said, Tracy, there's only Mr. Borman and Mr. Lovell and Mr. Anders, and, and, and just hardly anybody has ever gone to the moon before. And I kept asking these questions before this poor six-year-old girl could give me an answer. I'd, I, I guess enthusiastically, and I, I was at that time, would give her the answer. Went to the moon, came back, same six-year-old little girl, took her out in the backyard, looked at the moon, and I said, Tracy, and she says, Daddy, you've been to the moon. And I said, Tracy, you know how far? And she says, Daddy, the moon is way, way, way far away. And I said, Tracy, 
do you know? And she says, Daddy, you and Mr. Stafford came closer to the moon than anybody else. And I, I'd start to ask a question, and the kid would have the answer before. Uh, <laughs> You know, and I'm accustomed to talking, and to be beat by a six-year-old was really something. But all of a sudden, she looks at me, six-year-old is only a six-year-old uh, daughter can do, and she looks up and she says, Daddy, and I figured, this is the question. This is show and tell uh, in school the next day. And I want to promise you, when you live across the street from McDivitt and from Gordon and from Scott and next door to Mike Collins and to Al Bean and to Buzz Alder and all these other things, going to the moon for a six-year-old ain't any big deal. But she looks up at me and she says, Daddy, and I said, what, punk? She said, now that you've been to the moon and back, when are you going to take me camping like you promised me? <laughs> True words. The, the kind of thing that, uh, that truly does get you back to Earth in a hurry. Apollo 17 was unique. It was the last, the last uh, flight of Apollo. It wasn't planned to be, but that's the way it ended up to be. It was the first and only night launch in Apollo, which in itself, uh, having ridden the Saturn V during daytime, uh, riding it at night uh, just adds a little. It's like a night carrier landing. All these guys who are, excuse me, you guys, all you Navy pilots know what a, all you Navy pilots know what a carrier landing is, and it's a new dimension when it's at night. Uh, it was it was truly a challenge. It was even a challenge in training for that flight. As it should have been, we had little or no problems. The problems are what, or the problems were all taken up by the time we got to Apollo 17. The only problems we had were the fact that Ron Evans lost his scissors. And without your scissors in space, you can't eat, you can't, you can't, you can do little or nothing. And that was probably the major problem we had. Uh, it was the longest flight. And uh, on my crew, I had a geologist. The first time a professional scientist had, uh, had gone up in space and obviously appropriately to the moon. And Jack Schmidt did one hell of a job and did the job of a scientist and a job of a professional astronaut and aviator as well, very well as a matter of fact. I'd like to run very quickly through some slides, not to be redundant with some of the slides you've seen already. If I may, please. Uh, this is a crew. Uh, again, you've got to remember, this is 6, 17, 18 years ago. We do change. Uh, we did take the lunar rover. We've got uh, Ron Evans there on the right. Uh, uh, Naval Aviator, we've got Jack, who I just talked about, and uh, myself. Next, please. Uh, the only way that, that I can explain or describe this to you, and maybe some of you have seen it, uh, we launched at 12.33 a.m. in the morning after about a three-hour delay. And quite frankly, uh, I really did not believe we were going to go that night uh, because we had a, a pressure problem in the third stage of that booster. And the thing that bothered me most is that I was afraid all my friends would go home and wouldn't come back to see us three days later when we tried again. But this was described to me when, 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 the, when the booster lit up and when the, the light went, went across uh, the horizon was, was like the universe lit up from without. Uh, all the fish and all the, uh, everything that was in a pond apparently at that point in time just leaped out of the water instantaneously when the light came across. And then, of course, uh, then that rumbling Saturn V sound uh, a second later, came roaring across the crowd. Uh, and let me tell you, it was a roar inside. I, I could literally see, uh, through the only window we had, the reflection of that tremendous amount of, of, of effective sunlight uh, as I looked straight up out the window. Next, please. This is what, it, uh, someone sent me this picture from Orlando. It was obviously a, a time shot, but I thought it was pretty spectacular as we crossed the, uh, uh, the eastern sky. Next, please. This was one of our first views after we accelerated to 25,000 miles and began to leave the Earth. Uh, this is uh, uh, northern Africa, the Mideast. Uh, you can see uh, Saudi Arabia Peninsula, the Mediterranean, India on the right very, very clearly. Next, please. Doesn't take but a few short hours for this to happen. You, you know, in Earth orbit, you see, you see a, a, a sunrise and a sunset every, every 90 minutes. Uh, you see a horizon that's curved. Uh, very beautiful curved horizon, beautiful sunrises and sunsets. When you get to this point, uh, you realize that something strange has happened. This is a, a, a strange and yet familiar sight. And a horizon then bends around upon itself and closes in upon itself. And this is where you begin to see sunrises and sunsets happening before your very eyes rather than flying uh, through them as you do in Earth orbit. Next, please. By the way, that, the bottom of that picture was the South Pole. And it was in summertime. 
uh, down there. So it's the first time we've ever really begun to capture the continent of Antarctica where the ice cap was broken away. This is, of course, a picture you've all seen, uh, the famous Earth rise. Uh, it's a, it's a, as you come from around behind the moon uh, and you come in contact with the Earth, uh, this is one of those overpowering sites. Next, please. And this is a moon. This was our destination. I remember uh, after we, uh, we were on our way in Apollo 17, uh, Mission Control said, uh, uh, you're on your way. Uh, you're right on target. And I kept thinking, we're going we're gonna to head out to some place we can't see. We were landing in the very eastern edge of the moon. Therefore, it was not lit uh, when, we, when we started. It was like a new moon. So we really couldn't see where we were going. And we were headed out at 25 miles, 25,000 miles an hour to rendezvous with a target we couldn't see three days later. Uh, and we were, we were going to miss it by 50 miles. And I just called back. I said, <laughs> he said, you're, go you're right on target. You're going to miss the moon by 50 miles. And I said, God, I hope you're right. Next, please. This gives you an idea of the terrain in which we landed. This is a boulder field. Uh, we landed in a valley, not a large valley, but the Valley of Taurus Littrell, northeastern edge of the moon. We had to launch at night, by the way, in the month of December in 1972 in order to get the shadows where we wanted them uh, during landing. Uh, that valley uh, was a valley uh, about 20 miles across, surrounded by mountains that were higher than the Grand Canyon of Arizona is deep. So when we pitched over 7,000 feet, uh, I think I made a comment at that time, again, that we were really down among them, and you really were, because all of a sudden you could see these mountains rise out of your peripheral vision on the sides of the mountains. And, and that's, when, that's when that dream of yours began to, be, began to become a reality. That's when you really realized uh, uh, what was happening and where you were headed. Next, please. This is a, now a very famous painting of Al Bean's. Uh, this is a, a, a large rock that uh, you can see the size. That's Jack Schmidt on the left. Uh, there's our lunar rover. Most of you can't see, but there's a little white area just to the right of the peak uh, of that rock, of that boulder. And it's a little white area that was dusted out where we landed, and a lunar module sits in there. And relatively speaking, uh, compared to, uh, uh, to, the, to the wheel on a rover, it's probably about a tenth that size. It's just a little white area. Al eventually painted this uh, picture and did a mag uh, magnificent job. And, and he said, Gene, what is that? Uh, Al liked to put a story with all his pictures. He said, Gene, what is that, that little uh, handprint or mark uh, in that lunar dust on a boulder? And I said, Al, I just took a sample. I was on the side of the hill taking this picture, but, but I had prior to that taken a sample uh, to preserve and bring back uh, for the geologist to study. And he, and, and he said, well, is there something about this picture uh, that you can tell me? And I said, well, if I'd known it was going to be shown, as much as it, as it was, I, I wish I would have put Tracy's name in there. <laughs> and he said that, and Al's daughter and, and my daughter grew up together, as most of our children did here in this area. And he said, how would you do it? And I took a piece of paper and wrote T-R-A-C-Y. And so Al took that and never said another word. Next thing I know, this picture appeared in, uh, in Southwest uh, Art Magazine, famous painting by uh, Alan Bean, and I saw Tracy written in that boulder across there. <laughs> With, with, a, with a little, with a little uh, uh, scenario that went with it, it, uh, it said, I talked to Gene about, uh, about his remembrance of taking this picture, and he said he'd wish he'd put his daughter's name, or scraped his daughter's name in that boulder. He said, I decided to take uh, 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 an artist's privilege and go ahead and do it for him and save the taxpayers a lot of money and Gene another trip back to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Next, please. This is uh, just a picture of our rover. You notice there's no golf balls in sight on this one. Next. And here's a picture of driving the rover. We haven't loaded it up. This is very early. This is a mountain. And, and as amusing as John's comment was about the telephone poles, that's one of the big problems. You can't tell distance or size on the surface of the moon. You have nothing relatively to, to judge uh, distance by except the lunar module itself. And when you take that rover and you drive, 15 or 20 uh, kilometers away and go over the hills and around a bend, it's very difficult to find it in the first place, much less use it to judge uh, distance or size. Next, please. I've heard a lot about this one. Uh, this is John Young's creation. He was our backup. Uh, and uh, I, was, I have the privilege of being the only guy to have a wreck a quarter million miles away from the nearest car. I knocked the back part of that fender off, and uh, we lost it somewhere. It's 
Uh, well, I guess I did bring it back. I think it's in the Smithsonian now. We did find it, but uh, we couldn't put it back on. And the lunar dust was a tremendous problem. As you saw on John's picture of driving the, uh, the rover, that the dust would come up over the top, and we tried to drive without the fender, and it was like driving a dust room. We had to some way build a fender to keep that dust uh, from coming over uh, on us and on all of our equipment. John devised this, uh, uh, this fender uh, here, here on Earth and passed the word up, and we used a couple, uh, a couple camera clips we had, and i be honest with you, being an aviator first and a geologist second, I found no better use for two geology maps than, than that fender right there. <laughs> Next. That's just a picture, sort of a sentimental, nostalgic picture of, of, uh, of a place that, uh, that we lived for three days uh, in a valley of Torres Lake Trail. Next. This, of course, is a picture that we're all proud of. Uh, this happens to be a picture uh, uh, of me on the surface of the moon. Uh, next. This, perhaps, is my favorite. This is a picture of Jack. It's a picture I took of Jack. And I had to hold the camera upside down between my knees in order to get uh, both Jack and the flag and the earth and a depth of space. And uh, I think without a question, it is, it is my favorite picture of any pictures we have on the surface. I think it really, truly tells the story. And if you look very closely, I even, I'm even in a reflection of, uh, of Jack's visor there. Next. This is, uh, this is uh, the liftoff. Uh, we, we, were, we tried to get it on television on, a, on a previous two flights, and, and we lifted off, the limb lifted off the, off the moon so fast that, uh, that our television guru down here uh, couldn't quite move the television fast enough. Remember, it takes a second and a half, I think, to, to get the signal to the moon, and so we had to start ahead of time. This is just as we lit off that ascent engine, and you can see all the debris uh, spreading in all different directions. Uh, this picture is slightly discolored. There's been a lot of controversy about the color of the moon. There's still a lot of discussion. It's probably all nine of us here would give you a different impression of the actual color of the moon. This is a little discolored because I spilled coffee on this slide this morning. <laughs> Next, please. Shows us just a split second later, and we are on our way. And that is a unique and special moment. It's, uh, and it's a very critical moment because uh, in most cases, our engine, engines had to burn within a matter of, of a few few seconds, plus or minus a few seconds, or you truly did not make it in the lunar orbit. Uh, getting back in the command module was almost like, uh, like getting home, even though we were going to stay there in our particular case another, I think, two and a half or three days. Next, please. This picture, I think John or, or, uh, or you've seen before, and that's our command module when we came back. It's an experiment package. Uh, we meant to blow that, uh, that part of the, the command module away, unlike Apollo 13, and uh, Ron Evans was conducting a uh, a great deal of experiments while we were gone. Next, please. That's Ron. Uh, I guess he flew upside down the whole time we were gone, and he got accustomed to it. Uh, uh, this also also really happened. Uh, Jack Schmidt, who uh, tended or wanted to be a comedian a, num uh, a number of times, uh, when we opened our hatch to go into the lunar module, Ron, Ron's hatch wasn't open, and... Uh, and uh, Jack had something up his sleeve and was one up by Ron because uh, he just went knock, knock, knock. Of course, we were talking to each other through comm. He went knock, 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 and <laughs> Ron Evans says, who's there? <laughs> <laughs> Next. Well, it, this is a picture taken from the helicopter. Uh, I think I heard John Young one time say the most beautiful sight in all space flight is parachutes uh, at that moment in time. It surely was. Next. And I think, Al, we came just a little bit closer to, <laughs> to home than you did. I, 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 you know, I backed up, Al, on Apollo 14, and, and I, I, uh, that was a great challenge uh, to become Al Shepard's equal. <laughs> <laughs> but I've learned, I, I've learned uh, my role again since he is an admiral and I'm a captain. Maybe this is just a little bit further, Al, than you came. Next, I'd like to end this very quickly with, uh, with our patch, and we did become a little bit more philosophical as we, uh, as we ended the Apollo program. We call our spacecraft America and Challenger. Yes, there, uh, there was another Challenger. Uh, America, because we wanted to relate 
the spirit of Apollo to the American people who made it all possible. And indeed, there was a U.S. aircraft carrier named America. Challenge because, challenger because uh, that's what the Apollo program really was all about. It was a major challenge, and it was a challenge and a commitment that the President gave us a number of years earlier. Our patch was designed to, uh, to represent uh, the, the uh, mankind through the bust of Apollo. You notice mankind is looking to the future, which we wanted to represent by the stars and the heavens uh, and the planets. Uh, you see the moon in the upper corner. Uh, you will see the third thing we rep wanted to represent was country through the contemporary, today's modern American ego. But you certainly must notice that his wing is just touching the moon, meaning that we will not rest on our laurels of having gone to the moon, but we will lead all of mankind into the future. And I truly believe that that is our destiny. God bless and thank you. I'd just like to take uh, one more minute. I think we've probably seen a historic event today. I can't imagine on the 30th anniversary that there'll be enough of us left to even have a symposium. <laughs> when you get to be the age of Al Shepard, you've got to start worried about things like that. <laughs> Seriously, I'd just like to end very quickly. Uh, uh, for a long time, I was the Apollo spacecraft program manager, and I was a senior Air Force guy around here for a while, and, and went to a lot of going away parties. In a way, this is a going away party from Apollo and on to something new here. I uh, always told the people that, uh, that were leaving that if they had participated in Apollo, that was something they could be proud of the rest of their life. No matter what else they did, good, bad, or indifferent, nobody could take that away from them. I still believe that today, and I'm really proud to have been part of it. Thank you very much, and I hope you are too. Up next, a news conference held by NASA commemorating the 20th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon mission. During this briefing, you'll hear remarks from the crew of Apollo 11, its commander, Neil Armstrong, the command module pilot, Michael Collins, and Edwin Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot. Please wait for the mic. We have All other right. people that are. All right. Bill Hines of the Chicago Sun-Times. How are you? Hi, for uh, Neil Armstrong. Uh, in Houston on the 5th of uh, July, I believe it was, of 1969, I asked you if you had thought of any memorable words to say as you landed on the moon. You said you had not. Then on the 20th, when you did land, you gave us some very memorable words indeed. I'm wondering. When it came to you exactly, what would be the appropriate thing to say? Are you talking, I'm sure, about Hello Houston, the Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed? Yeah. Well, that was, I thought that was kind of self-evident at the time. I, <laughs> now, that's not the one. I was speaking of was uh, a small step for a man, giant leap for mankind. Um, well, it was, a, it was a statement that was natural in the sense of the time. It was a, a step and a step and uh, thought about it uh, 
really after we got there. <laughs> yeah. Kathy Sawyer. Kathy Sawyer from the Washington Post. I'd like to hear from each one of you what if if you were on President Bush's advisory staff, what would you recommend he do next? What course would you chart uh, to uh, promote the human expansion into into space? Would you go to the moon first and then Mars, the other way around, or some different scenario? Well, um, I, the advisory council, which has re recently been reestablished under the current administration, I suppose has that that charge, and I don't know how they're attacking it. Uh, I uh, would recommend that they not really spend a lot of time reviewing current programs, but they take a longer look so that they can put the policies in place that will establish the programs of the 90s and the next century. Uh, I'm, I'm very much pro-Mars. I think that uh, the, this country should establish now a long-range goal with no firm timetable, but a long-range goal of exploring and setting up a colony on Mars and in, invite uh, participation by other nations, and that we, uh, that is the, uh, the one goal that to me I think would have a, a unifying and perhaps even an electrifying effect upon NASA, this country, our space program, and uh, space business around the globe. I'd certainly like to see a gradual evolutionary program expanding outward uh, that includes whatever is necessary moving toward uh, permanent presence in the solar system. Uh, and I contrast that with, uh, with going to the moon several times and uh, then essentially pulling back from that for a long period of time. Who knows exactly when we'll get back to the moon. I, I just don't think that uh, that sort of thing ought to be done to Mars, that we go there on several expeditionary uh, ventures and then uh, not follow up on it. I'd like to see an evolutionary program and, and I would see that uh, more than likely involving both lunar exploitation and uh, movement outward toward Mars and the commonality of uh, the equipment uh, that's needed to, to carry those out. John Bisney with United Stations Radio, I guess for Neil or Buzz, a book that came out a couple of years ago about the building of the LM described a scene of some concern in the Moker a few minutes after you landed, uh, some gauges showing apparently a frozen slug of fuel in one of the descent stage fuel lines close to a valve, and they were quite concerned about it to the point that the Grumman engineering manager, John Corson, was recommending you ought to just lift off right away. I assume that you two have become aware of this in the intervening years. Do you talk about that when you found out how much danger do you think you were really in? Should you have lifted off right away? Well, I do recall the incident, but I don't recall my reaction at the time. Uh, it was uh, something that was being monitored, and uh, I do not recall any enthusiasm on our part for uh, rapid liftoff. being made aware of that particular situation and, and it wouldn't have been in real time it would have been after the fact and there wasn't much that we could do about it we, since we weren't the repositories of uh, the most up-to-date information the people in mission control certainly were I'm uh, it's Paul Paul Hoverston here with USA Today and a question for uh, for Neil or for Buzz uh, gentlemen, the scientists tell us that the footprints that uh, you left on the moon uh, could be there for hundreds, uh, perhaps even thousands of years from now. Uh, could you give us uh, some of your thoughts on that uh, sense of permanence uh, that you've established uh, up there? Do you ever think about that at all? No, I haven't. I kind of hope that somebody goes up there one of these days and cleans, that, cleans them up. <laughs> I'm uh, Charles Grunhaus with Netherlands uh, Television. I have a question, uh, uh, first of all, for Mr. Aldrin. Um, in the last minutes before landing on the moon, you had communication with uh, Steve Bales and Mission Control about alarm signals on your computer screen, 1201, 1202, 1204. Could you describe exactly what happened and what your reaction was? And 
Question for Mr. Armstrong. Did you realize, Mr. Armstrong, that after you shut off your engines after landing on the moon, you had only between 7 and 17 seconds of fuel left? Um, first, uh, we were communicating with, with Charlie Duke. Some of you will re remember that. But he was communicating with uh, Steve Bale. And uh, uh, with re re I let Buzz talk about the, uh, the, the his understanding of alarms because he was uh, spending a lot of his attention on that at the time while I was, uh, I had a certain interest in the fuel gauge. The fuel gauge is not very accurate. Uh, the, uh, uh, the gauge itself uh, and the gauging system was not accurate. We had a low level sensor port which told us that the fluid level got down to a certain part and, and that was kind of a finite point in time, or uh, fuel left. Uh, that didn't really particularly uh, uh, worry me at that point in time. Uh, we were used to flying the lunar landing training vehicle with very low amounts of fuel, uh, very few number of seconds left before touchdown. That, uh, and at that point, we were low at a low enough altitude that uh, probably if the in we'd had fuel exhaustion, uh, we, the landing gear was capable of the, of the fall that we would have had into the, the surface. And we would have kept attitude control, so uh, it wasn't thing that really concerned me. <clears throat> if you remember, we, uh, the early part of powered descent, uh, were, were face down. And uh, I, I might add that uh, we also, because we were engaged in this first rather audacious maneuver of powered descent uh, for the first time, we felt that, you know, th things could possibly uh, not happen exactly the way things might want them to, so we wanted everything in, in our uh, favor, and one of those was to uh, be sure that uh, our way home was assured, and, and that meant being able to catch Mike wherever he might be, and uh, the radar was a little bit more accurate than our eyeballs were, so we felt it only natural to leave the, the rendezvous radar on, and it was uh, reflected in the checklist. Uh, as we were face down, the landing radar was not receiving any information. When we yawed around, shortly thereafter, 30,000, 25,000 feet, at, I'm not sure exactly when, uh, the uh, computer popped out some of these program alarms, which light a caution warning, blank the disky display, and uh, give a, a code as to what it is. And uh, I, I think it caught both of us unawares. It diverted our attention from whatever else we were doing, and primarily at that point, I was doing a sequential scan of in the cockpit and relaying to Neil what the computer was displaying so that he was able to uh, begin to look and adjust to the scene he was seeing out the window right away. So when things like that happen out of the ordinary, we both get diverted <coughs> our attention. But fortunately, uh, some of the simulations pre prior to flight had indicated that uh, perhaps some of the mission controllers needed a bit more information as to what some of those computer overloads or, or whatever the alarms might be, and they had done some homework on that. I was not aware that that had happened or that something similar to that had happened in a, in a simulation. Uh, I think the backup 11 pilot was flying with Neil at the time. Um, essentially, it was a diversion of attention, and it, it involved uh, things that were happening that were beyond our ability to fully comprehend, but fortunately, because all of that information was being sent back down to the ground. They knew the status of things and could make a value judgment, and we certainly had every reason to have high confidence in them. So it continued to be a bit of a nuisance from that point on, even though it changed from one alarm to the other. Uh, I think had the first program alarm occurred at 500 feet where Neil took over manually, uh, it might have caused considerably more concern and, and diversion of, of uh, attention. I might also... It indicate that we were at a significant uh, disadvantage in comparison to succeeding flights in terms of the autopilot that was available to us. It was significantly improved later on in the ability to, to give this control of the spacecraft back to the computer so that it could null out the motion over the surface to zero or as best it could and then it could we could uh, control the rate of descent on down. But once Neil took over, it was up to him to 
through changing attitude control to null out those translation rates. And uh, that's a significant uh, increase in the talent level needed. And he was certainly up to it. Uh, Harry Rosenthal, the Associated Press. The three of you became heroes at a time when the United States was very short of heroes and was looking for some. And yet you, Mr. Armstrong, more than the other two, but all three of you, sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. And you didn't reappear until the, uh, uh, you were on the Challenger Commission. Why did you retreat so much when uh, NASA probably could have used your uh, uh, celebrity to keep the space program going? Um, gosh, I didn't know that I did that. <laughs> uh, I uh, was here in Washington for a time, uh, run an aeronautics program at NASA, and uh, then I went back to the university, and uh, they, folks at the university would be very surprised that they would, they're considered to be off the face of the earth. <laughs> But I thought that was that was a worthwhile thing for me to be doing, and uh, I'm glad I did. You uh, you stayed out of the public eye uh, when you could have been. The other two wrote books. Uh, you didn't write. You haven't written a book of memoirs, uh, publicity appearances that could have helped. You weren't part of. That's the kind of thing I mean. Well, I was pleased doing the things I was doing. Uh, I guess that's the sum sum and substance of it. Tom McChrystal with uh, FrontierNet. Uh, certainly the moon landing, the first moon landing, was a major event of the 1960s. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on the effects of that event in terms of how it affected how we look at the world and uh, just really the uh, changes that it made in society. Uh, you know, the Apollo 11 landing was, uh, in effect, a catalyst to a lot of other things. And I'd like to sort of get your perspective on this whole thing that you did out of this one event. Not sure I, I, th I think it'd be a great under understatement to say that it was the most significant event that happened in my life. Uh, Professionally, uh, I felt that I was developing myself in an understanding of, uh, of how one carries out uh, activities through the orbital relationships. Uh, so I look back uh, on my participation in, a, in Apollo, not only as a crewman, but also as, as one who had the opportunity to make some contributions in the techniques of how we carried that out. Uh, certainly, it, it changed my image of myself because of the image uh, that was changed throughout the world of me and then the ability to perhaps try and live up to that to your standards and to my standards was a most significant challenge. Uh, I think uh, that right now I'm very satisfied with uh, my ability to project my uh, talents to be very useful to the space program in, in terms of how we might carry out uh, expeditions and evolutionary missions to Mars. I'm very satisfied with with what I'm putting together in that area, and that's one of creative, innovative analysis from orbital standpoint of the how to do that in a, in a really innovative way of getting to Mars. Yes, I'm Linda Scott from Conus Communications. Aside from the changes in your personal lives, what do you believe was your most important contribution to the manned space program? I don't have any answer. I can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think of one for him. He did his job very well. <laughs> Gene Garner, KTRK TV, Houston. Um, any of you, uh, Mr. Armstrong or Mr. Aldrin, remember from your training, particularly the lunar landing training vehicle, what remembrances do you have of uh, that training session, or those training sessions? <clears throat> well, I, uh, I, I recall that uh, very well, not just because uh, I was involved in it at Houston, but because I'd been involved in it far earlier 
even before there, we, there was a lunar module, we were looking at something that eventually became the LLRV, which later became, uh, subsequent development became the LLTV. So I'd been with it for a decade, uh, almost, and uh, it was a, a wonderful device that was uh, uh, risky. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we lost a few of them along, along the way. Uh, difficult to manage, but yet was an essential ingredient in our preparing to do the, uh, the final descent to touchdown uh, uh, in the lunar module. And I, if we were going to have problems, I think it's very fortunate that we had them here in the uh, lunar landing training vehicle where you had an ejection seat that could get you out of trouble uh, rather than have them uh, close by the surface of the moon. Dan Billow with WESH TV in Orlando. Would any of you uh, recreate the, uh, the few moments that uh, during which you were entering the Apollo spacecraft on the, on the morning of launch and what, what do you remember of that and do you remember the man who I believe uh, was helping you into the spacecraft? I believe his name is Gunter Wendt. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we had uh, fortunately a uh, glorious morning uh, on that July Sunday morning. Uh, Gunter Wendt, uh, often known as the pod Fuhrer, uh, held his position uh, with uh, patience and, and uh, perseverance. He had done so for many years and uh, I think only recently retired from that job after holding the position for some decades. Uh, he was always reliable. Uh, we, uh, and he was always a, a great source of amusement. By, by circumstance, I, I uh, was treated to a particularly uh, memorable, pleasurable moment while, uh, while the pad leaders and other people were uh, inserting or installing Mike and Neil into the uh, spacecraft. Uh, I had what seemed like about 20 minutes uh, waiting uh, by myself uh, up at some uh, level, two-thirds of the way up or wh whatever it was, for, uh, to, to just walk around briefly and, and gaze with my little air conditioning unit uh, pumping uh, life support breathing into me rather coolly. I could watch the sunrise and watch the waves coming in moments before uh, this giant Saturn was going to burst into action and propel us off. And, and it was a, a, a most memorable moment looking out and seeing some evidence of of the millions of people, and yet not any any precise indication that there were that many people paying attention to what we were doing at that very moment. And here I was just wandering around. They didn't know that, that I was wandering around the, the upper portions of this looking <coughs> looking out at them. It's, it's a bit similar to the brief realization that uh, went through my mind without crystallizing itself into words at the time uh, when we were on the surface shortly after both of us we're out on the surface of how unique, how ironic it is that two people are so far away from home, and yet at the same time, more people are paying attention to what it is we're doing. That's generally not the case. The further away from home you get, the less people care about what you're doing. Muriel Pearson, CBS News. This is a question for all of you. Um, what was the moment of uh, greatest personal fear for each of you during the flight, besides knowing that you'd have to face all of us when you got back? <laughs> well, compared to that, all the rest uh, sort of pale and insignificant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would just answer that uh, uh, I think probably uh, the thing you fear most is the unexpected. Uh, we were used to spend a lot of time practicing uh, our responses to, uh, to various kinds of failures and abnormal circumstances. 
and I think we felt fairly comfortable with most of the, the kinds of things that uh, might happen. Uh, the ones you worry about are the ones you didn't foresee and didn't properly prepare yourself for. Well, I, I would say uh, you know, flying to the moon is a long and, uh, and delicate daisy chain of events. Uh, any link in the chain, if it gets severed, uh, ruins the whole thing. The, uh, the one that it wasn't fear, but it was mistrust. The one that I mistrusted the most was the rendezvous part. That was the, the thing that was on my mind uh, primarily, was bringing these two vehicles, uh, bringing this ungainly looking critter back up from the surface of the moon successfully. Okay, we're going to uh, take a question. I understand we have from our overflow uh, auditorium down on the fifth floor. Uh, if you will state your question, uh, name and affiliation, please. Yeah, it's Chris Rocher with uh, Scripps League Newspapers. A question to all three of you. If you could relive one moment of the mission, uh, which moment would you pick and a brief reason why? Relive one moment? I, I didn't uh, understand it. If, if you could pick one moment of the Apollo 11 mission, uh, to relive now, which moment would you pick and a brief reason why? I guess I would uh, pick a moment when I was looking out the window and looking at uh, a full earth from a long distance. I'm, I'm most aware of my uh, observational limitations to see exactly what's happening in rapid pace uh, uh, events, and I, I'd like to uh, replay again by being there the last uh, 20 seconds, uh, 10 seconds before touchdown and 10 seconds after. I'd, I'd just like to run through that again. I, I, I remember uh, most vividly the, uh, the picture of the, the lunar horizon and the uh, limb ascent stage in the foreground with these two guys in it, and then the Earth popping up at that instant. So you have all three lined up. You got uh, three billion people over there, two people here, and that's it. <laughs> that's what I remember. And the one behind the camera had the foresight to record it on film. <laughs> I understand we have uh, one more question from down below. Is there a question from uh, the fifth floor? My name's Jeff Neesmith. I'm with the Cox Newspapers. Mr. Armstrong, your experiences uh, have excited millions of people, yet it seems like you're kind of bored and even a little resentful sometimes of, of the excitement other people feel about what you've experienced. Why do you suppose that's true? Why, why do you think you leave that impression with people? Well, I, I can't put myself in your eyes. <laughs> Uh, that's not the way I feel, but if that's uh, your perception, uh, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to explain it to me. <laughs> okay, uh, Howard. Uh, Howard Benedict, Associated Press. Uh, there were some reports that uh, the original flight plan called for uh, Buzz to be the, uh, the, the first man to get out and walk on the moon. And Mike Collins, in his book, uh, Carrying the Fire, mentions uh, or hints at a dispute between uh, Neil and Buzz over this. In fact, he mentions a particularly stormy night when you uh, over a bottle of scotch to uh, settle some of your disputes. How did it, was there a dispute between you two over who should be the first on the moon, and how was that selection made for Neil and Buzz? Well, both of these gentlemen have written on that subject, and, uh, and uh, I haven't. So uh, I'll just tell you that although they may or may not have known what my feelings and facts were at the time, that uh, I had zero input, no input whatever, into that decision. Peter Ford, WRC-TV in Washington. Uh, we'd like to get some fresh voice tape for uh, voiceover for all that video you sent back from the moon. I wonder if uh, the three of you could each recall or give a brief commentary in your response to the feelings you had. Mike, when you first came up over the moon into lunar orbit, Buzz, when you were going into that 20 seconds you just described, you'd like to relive. 
and kneel when you step down on the moon on the surface. I thought I just did. <laughs> Can you describe when you came up over there? We, I, when you first came in there, when you first came into lunar orbit, and uh, you, you realized you were real, really close to making history. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm going to talk separately about that. Idea. Then, Buzz, could you, well, could I, you uh, recall <coughs> what you had, uh, what you saw, and what you felt in that 20 seconds, or the 10 seconds you said you were talking over there? Uh, I think the reason I selected those is because there were uh, events happening rather rapidly, and I could tell you that uh, my feelings were, gee, golly, fantastic, is this really happening? And, but no, I knew I was there. I was trying the best uh, to be as receiving uh, a human as I could. Why? To savor the moment so I could tell you about it afterward? No, to respond if needed uh, uh, to some requirement on my part to, to be responsive. Uh, in, in general, I think when things were happening in a hurry, that's, that was our, our feeling, our sense. I'm not certain I understand the question, but I'll answer anyway. <laughs> uh, the, the touchdown itself, from my point of view, was a real high in terms of elation. Not so much for the instant, but because it marked the achievement that a third of a million people had been working for a decade to accomplish. And it was a feeling of we, a third of a million people, managed it. Uh, Vincent Del Judice from UPI. Uh, had America kept going to the moon over the last 20 years, um, would we have seen, in your uh, gentlemen's opinions, manned colonies there, perhaps an observatory of some type? And what is the feasibility of establishing a uh, moon-based telescope and perhaps colonies or even cities on the moon? That's uh, <coughs> largely hypothetical uh, kind of question, but uh, had, had we had a, a continuing lunar program over the subsequent two decades, I'm sure that uh, we would have devised habitable modules uh, that were enjoyable and processes for developing lunar resources, uh, extracting oxygen from the rocks, and hopefully finding hydrogen, which is the perhaps the most missing element. Or hydrogen and carbon are, the, are uh, very rare up there. Uh, and uh, would have developed a lot of science uh, in the t time period. Uh, would it have cost a lot? Probably. Maybe we weren't aware of it, or I wasn't at the time, but I think the signs were uh, clear to those in management uh, that by the time we reached there, there was uh, an ending to the Apollo program somewhere downstream in terms of the number of uh, uh, of landings that we could accomplish. And I guess uh, an option is to stretch those out over a period of time, but that generally costs a good bit more. Uh, ret hindsight or retrospective uh, is always a, you're treated to be more uh, brilliant in looking back on it, but uh, certainly uh, I think we did the best at the time with what, what we had left. Uh, we flew. Uh, Skylab, uh, a remarkable uh, achievement uh, and, an, uh, and a great opportunity. I think it was overshadowed by the fact that uh, we continued on landings and it was a bit of a letdown. But to have built two of those and flown one and then allowed it to burn up, uh, when we now look at the difficulties we have gathering together the funding, the support for something of a smaller volume, uh, maybe less achievement, we certainly shouldn't have let that one come down. We should have flown the second one, and I think the, the course of the space program would have changed enormously uh, had we done that. Uh, I'm sure that we would have liked to have continued on and established a, a, a particular base, uh, including a telescope on the far side, and that certainly is one of the uh, premium objectives that, that a science return to the moon will, uh, will have as one of its uh, goals. Mars. <laughs> 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 
Uh, Elisa Tesser from REI Italian Television. A uh, question to Mr. Aldrin and to the other two gentlemen also. Uh, regarding more the future than the past, what do you think that the 20 year olds of today know about your expedition and what do you think the impact of your uh, great enterprise was on the new generation? And do they know about it? How do they feel about it? Well, I. Th I think the first person to begin to project a difference in, in those that grew up since that time that I can recall, uh, at least chatting with, was Buckminster Fuller. He, he had a definite uh, sense that those who grew up uh, since Apollo looked at life differently uh, than those of us that uh, perhaps experienced portions of the, of the Depression. Uh, there, there are not the same limits to those who grow up seeing that, that one could achieve such a, uh, an audacious thing as land on the moon when you look right now and you're nowhere near doing that. That is a tremendous achievement back in the past and you just feel naturally that, that you can recreate that. So I think that there's a, uh, a sense of, of a potential that, that is maybe not being exercised that may exist in those that have grown up since then. Greg Linebaugh, Space Explorer magazine. Would you guys tell us some of your career plans in the next five years until you're subjected to the 25th anniversary press conference? Career plans? Was that career plans? What you're going to do. Keep doing what we're doing. Try to do it better. <laughs> I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to earn my living as a writer. I'm uh, writing a book on Mars. I intend to continue uh, writing. I don't know what after the Mars book, but I'll think of something. <clears throat> About five years ago, I was exploring some uh, creative ways of uh, continuous uh, cycling uh, ships between Earth and Mars, and then I turned, or Earth and the Moon, then I turned that attention uh, onto Mars, and it now seems to be gathering uh, a bit of favor within the exploration office. Uh, that is a, a spaceship that continues to move around the sun and swings by Mars and Earth and Mars and Earth, and we can get on it and off it as it swings by. And uh, so I want to continue to pursue uh, those activities of, of individual uh, contribution uh, with whoever will listen. Uh, I, I just finished writing a book. Uh, I, I need a lot of help rather than Mike, who can, seems to be able to do this by himself. And uh, I, I had envisioned being able to deal a little bit more with uh, the lessons of Apollo as it may apply directly to what our choices are for the future. That it didn't get done. Uh, so I think that there's some unfinished business uh, in terms of thinking of recording some things within the next five years. Uh, we may not get the, the, the commitment to go off to Mars uh, this year, uh, but we may get it by 92 or uh, by 94. So uh, uh, I'm going to be in there pushing and pulling and uh, see if I can't uh, take the benefit of my experience in some way uh, even though the, the technical parts of it are not, not that financially rewarding, uh, if I can tell a story to some, someone else, why well, maybe there's a, uh, an ethical honorarium that can be, uh, come my way that can compensate maybe for uh, not the direct return for what I feel is a direct creative contribution. Okay, these uh, gentlemen have very busy schedules. We're going to take two more questions and then wrap up this session. Uh, go ahead, right here. Greg Barr with uh, Space Daily. Twenty years ago, it seemed that it was very natural and appropriate for a government agency to take on the Apollo project and accomplish it. Today, it seems to be problematic in terms of cost and so on, whether we continue to do missions of that scale. Um, would you say that, well, for, for any of you or all of you, would you stand behind recommendations that more uh, stress or, or emphasis should be put on getting private entrepreneurs and the commercial sector involved in a more rapid fashion than is being accomplished today? Well, of course, that uh, concept has been uh, encouraged in recent years. Uh, I think predominantly the problem is that uh, uh, the projects are, are quite massive and it's very difficult to do little little projects that are within the reach of the of uh, 
typical uh, industrial concerns and uh, consequently effort and because uh, many of the activities are r regulated by the governments uh, involved why uh, the government is to some extent a participant uh, in any case Hi. Anna Grower with the Orlando Sentinel you all have been quite circumspect and diplomatic thus far in talking about uh, the likelihood for uh, significant funding for uh, all the ventures that, that you are advocating so strongly. Do either do any of you in, in fairly frank terms here in diplomatic Washington want to talk about what you think is the likelihood in the next four years of the Bush administration of getting the kind of money you want? I have no idea. <laughs> I think all we can do is hope. 